in most jurisdictions with comparable bylaws and are regulated at a provincial level. The applicable provincial requirements will determine whether or not face coverings are required in these places. For employee-only spaces, this is a recognition of the good work done by many local business to, businesses to install physical barriers between their staff and patrons. Where these barriers exist, staff behind the barrier will not be required to wear face coverings, but will be required to use one in other public areas. This mirrors the approach taken with other transit operators, with our transit operators who wear face coverings while in transit stations, but remove them when behind the shield in a bus or within the operator's compartment in an LRT vehicle. This bylaw is intended as a temporary part of the city's response to COVID-19 pandemic. While none of us can predict how long face coverings might be a necessary public health measure, the proposed bylaw includes a sunset clause to repeal the bylaw on December 31st, 2020. At any time prior to December, council can amend this date to shorten or extend the bylaw. If this bylaw is passed, administration would immediately begin a public and internal awareness and education campaign regarding the new requirements and ex exceptions. The intention is to gain voluntary compliance and our enforcement officers will lead with awareness and education. We do not intend to refuse service if the public is not wearing a face covering on transit or in city facilities, but the bylaw does create the option to issue fines. We proposed a $100 fine which is higher than the $50 fine in the bylaw recently passed in Calgary and slightly lower than the $150 fine contained in BAMP's bylaw. As a bylaw, Council has final say on the content and timing of these proposed measures. Council can, by motion today, amend any of the elements of the bylaw that have been discussed today, including where the requirements will apply, the exceptions, the length of time it is in effect, and the fine amount. Council can choose whether to give the bylaw all three readings and have it come into force at a later date, or it can give only the first reading and monitor the public health indicators. A special council meeting can be called within 24 hours notice to give further readings if required. Alternatively, council can refer the bylaw back to administration with direction on changes or to return in the future if the public health indicators change. That concludes our presentation and uh, we're all prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, very much, Adam. And I know you came back from a uh, much needed, well-deserved holiday as well for this. So thank you. And I know city staff have had to turn it around uh, in, in a tight time. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I don't know if uh, I have questions, but it would be appropriate to move to put first reading on the floor right now. Yes. Okay, then I'll move that uh, first I'll reading. I'll second it. Okay, great. So that's before us. Okay, go ahead with questions. Thank you. So, so just a few, so I'm going to go through a list of questions. So the reason, for example, that right now we don't have to wear face coverings in this building, and this will hopefully extrapolate out to other examples, is that technically this space is closed to the public right now. The public's able to watch, but because we're in an enclosed building, not available to the public, and we've got barriers, that's why we don't each have to wear masks right now in this building. Is that correct? That's correct. There's also okay. the element of, of cohort. So yeah. if you can't, um, within your cohort, there's a, a relaxation of the physical distancing requirements. But if you can, then there is some relaxation. So how that extrapolates to different businesses. So I've heard from you know a, a law office that said if they're in their office not meeting with a client, they don't, they don't need to wear a mask. If a client comes into their office, face covering needs to be put on because now they're exposed to somebody. Is that... Correct. That's correct. Okay. Uh, a public interaction, and it could be, as I mentioned in the speaking notes, it could be via a barrier or a mask. Yeah. Likewise, if you're in a uh, manufacturing facility and everyone had, so that's not open to the public, uh, but if there weren't barriers up and they were not within a, a part six feet, they would be required to wear a face covering. And sorry to give some specific examples, but these are what I've got, so I just want to walk through it all to be clear. Yes, depending on whether they've established that they're a cohort. Fair, okay, thank you. That's helpful context as well, all right. Uh, I'm gonna move on to 
the age exemption. So it seems like a, a lot of the bylaws have set that age at two, it, under two would not be required, any, anyone over two would be. Can you provide any guidance as to why that number has been set? It seems to be standard, but I just, I don't know if there's any, if you have any information on that. Um, I'll start and then just see if uh, Ms. Nancy Jacobson has anything to add, because sure. she's sort of been the one researching what the various municipalities have been doing. I think it has been typically under the age of two, although there is one municipality that I saw had the age of five. Okay. Um, it would seem to me that it has to do more with just the age of the kids and the ability, like, taking it on, taking it off, and being able to give them direction. Okay. Nancy, did you have anything you would like to add to that? No, thanks, Bonnie. It is a consistency piece. Most jurisdictions are using children under the age of two. Okay, and that's what I've seen both in terms of jurisdictions and even individual businesses and things, but just wanted to understand that. So the bylaw currently has an end date, which as you've noted, can be repealed earlier if we wanted to, or council could meet to extend if, if, so, if so needed. Uh, the one other uh, measure I was wondering about is, is if we asked for any guidance from Alberta Health around would there be clear health outcomes that might trigger a repeal of the bylaw? Because right now it's primarily focused on date, and, I, and, and I'm just wondering if there's value in having some guidance from them as to what they might look for. So I think certainly if um, in our mandatory criteria, if we get to a level five where the province indicates that mandatory face coverings are required, then then we would likely repeal this bylaw because the appropriate jurisdiction has stepped in from a health perspective. I was wondering, oddly enough, the, in the reverse scenario. So if our number of cases got down to five, I, I don't know if, we, if we've asked about that and, and sought out any guidance to help inform what we might use to, to decide that. Well, well David, can, David Aiken can weigh in on this as well, but my understanding is that uh, um, provincially they've identified that uh, uh, highly recommended, but not mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, right now, our watch cases are below the 50 threshold. We okay. certainly have had some that have creeped into the, some of the zones mm -hmm. that have creeped into that threshold. Um, and you recall from last week's discussion, uh, based on feedback from our patrons of city facilities, we felt it was the right step for city services to go to this step. Yeah. This bylaw is... Um, really a council discussion in terms of comfort level of council to make this mandatory across the city. Yeah, I, I guess, and the, the reason I ask in recognizing that, that it would be a council decision is just if there was guidance from someone like Dr. Score to say, here's some of the things you would want to look at, and not necessarily a hard and fast set of rules, but uh, I think it was Dr. Score himself after Mayor Iveson's questions that said, this is, this is a reasonable step for us to take. Likewise, it might be nice to know what might be a reasonable set of outcomes that could potentially have us consider something differently. And, and we don't need it necessarily built into the bylaw, but just something that we could be thinking about and watching. And we, we, we measure, as you know, we measure a number of those indicators already. Yeah. And I think uh, through our various touch points with council or the emergency advisory committee, we can alert you to, and through Mr. Aiken's weekly update, mm -hmm. we can alert you to any changes of those indicators that may indicate a, a reconsideration of the bylaw. I think specifically the, 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 the broadest one of number of cases per 100,000, if we were to get a significant reduction in that regard, uh, then that would certainly be a consideration. But then some of the other, called the micro indicators, could also uh, um, um, indicate that. So I think it would be the regular touch points that we have, either through EAC or the regular correspondence from Mr. Egan. Great. I'm out of time. I might have some more, depending on if they get asked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Banga, then Councillor Nickel, then Councillor McKean, then Councillor Zadig. Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, a few questions uh, regarding uh, the levels of uh, protection. Last week, we approved uh, level two, and uh, today, uh, we're working towards level three. Uh, Mr. Lawson, could you be able to tell me what happened now that wasn't happening last week? Uh, so last week, under administrative authority, we moved to level two, and the reason for that was the feedback from the users of city facilities, whether it be transit or other, 
And so administratively, just similar to a business, if you hear from your patrons that they would feel more comfortable if masks were mandatory, we administratively made that decision. As part of that discussion, council uh, identified and, and we indicated that we had draft bylaws ready, um, but council indicated that they were interested in those bylaws. And so uh, we're having that meeting today for council to discuss um, whether uh, we should move to level three or not. Okay, and uh, with the numbers, uh, with everything that's uh, surrounding us, are you comfortable in recommending level three? Well, we're, we're comfortable. Um, we've shared previously that uh, based on the indicators, um, we don't think it's absolutely mandatory, but uh, I think we're totally comfortable moving in that direction uh, uh, should the bylaw pass. Okay, uh, should the bylaw pass. Uh, still, I think I probably asked the same question last time. Uh, Alberta government not doing it but we are going over and beyond. Are we almost contradicting each other? And if so, are they, um, can they overrule us? Uh, so I'll start with the first question, are we contradicting? I, I wouldn't say we're contradicting because the provinces um, uh, through the Chief Medical Officer of Health is that masks are strongly recommended. Uh, this is a, um, an added level to that, so I don't think it's contradictory. I think it's supplementary based on the conditions in an urban municipality. Um, as far as the second one, can the province uh, overrule our, by our bylaw? I'll, I'll ask Ms. Andrichuk or Ms. Jacobson to answer that question. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Um, I think we answered this last week as well. So the province can always issue um, a health order on this and we would look to harmonize. We can have them coexist. Um, and again, we can take steps to sort of add additional measures where they're um, in alignment or more strict than what the province has done, but we can't contradict what the province would require. So if they said um, something was mandatory, we wouldn't be able to undo the mandatory, but we could add to it. Thank know. you. And uh, with other jurisdictions around Edmonton, uh, have everybody done the same thing what we are doing or uh, are we the leading jurisdiction? Well, um, the mayor may be able to uh, provide additional information based on his conversations with the other mayors, but um, following last week, we have been in conversation with our counterparts within the region and we are hearing that um, um, other municipalities are going in the same direction administratively, specifically related to transit. Uh, as it relates to others, it's ongoing conversations. And in terms of bylaws, um, I do believe there's consideration in other municipalities, but the mayor may want to uh, supplement that. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I understand uh, uh, transit will be uh, consistent across the region, I think. Uh, for the most part, uh, that's to be confirmed and has to go through some uh, EAC or council meetings uh, in our in our neighboring municipalities. But uh, been in close contact with the mayors about that over the last week or so. Um, as and as for the the general mandate, um, uh, I think a number of our neighbors are looking to us. I think if we don't, they it's less likely that they will. Uh, in some cases, uh, I think if we do, it's more likely that uh, they will align to what we're doing in the city. There is some, some have, have indicated specifically, um, you know, wanting to be aligned with the city on this um, and are looking to us for leadership uh, today, uh, one way or the other. Okay. And until they do that, uh, I'm going to take an example of e-bus traveling from Red Deer to Edmonton. Uh, would those folks would be required to wear, not wear masks when they're traveling, but as soon as they enter city of Edmonton, they have to have the masks on? 
That's correct, as soon as they're within city limits. Okay. How much time do I have, Mr. Mayor? Time's up. I can put you down for a second round, Thank though, you. if you'd like. Please do. Okay. Thank you. Noted. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nickel. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Laughlin, uh, with, so the province hasn't mandated masks, have they? No, they continue to say strongly recommended. Certainly. I certainly have no problem with regards to city facilities and city-operated uh, buses and so on. But I do have great concerns with regards to the stepping into the private sector uh, and the conduct of their businesses. Have you been made aware of some of the conflicts that are happening in Calgary right now? Um, I'm not sure, Councillor Nickel. Um, do you have an example? Yes, I've had contact with uh, employers in Calgary, uh, offices that are run here, and what has happened now is that we have employees arguing with employees about who should be wearing masks and who should not be wearing masks because there's a question of what is a public space. And so my question to you, Mr. Laughlin, do you consider the back of a warehouse or a manufacturing shop a uh, public space? I'll start, and Ms. Andrzejczyk and Ms. Jacobson can supplement, but if, if a member of the public accesses a facility, it would be considered a public space. And I know it gets gray, your example of the warehouse. Um, and, and to my answer to Councillor Nack's earlier question, if they're considered within a cohort within that facility, then it may not be mandatory. But I'll ask Ms. Andrzejczyk or Ms. Jacobson to supplement. Um, I'll perhaps start. Um, I'm not familiar with the specific examples in Calgary. Um, Councillor Nickel, these definitions do have, have some subjectivity. They're not going to be um, crystal clear in all situations, but should apply to most. Uh, Mr. Lachlan has correctly indicated what we're looking at for public space, which is where the public member can open a door and enter into an area. Keep in mind in Calgary, their bylaw has not yet taken effect, which may be causing some of the confusion as well. And typically, warehouses would not be a public space if it's, again, limited to where um, just employees would have access. Ms. Jacobson, do you have any comments? I would echo a lot of that to say that the test is really whether or not a patron has unfettered right to enter and exit the space. So warehouses, kitchens and restaurants, those types of locations are not going to be public places but a place where a customer may come in to pick up an order or interact with staff would be a public place. Uh, Councillor Nicol, if, if I may just add a, a couple extra points. Um, we, we are aware of those concerns, uh, in particular the restaurant uh, business. Um, Alberta Health Services uh, public health inspectors have reached out uh, expressing that there are some issues with confusion about whether they should or should not wear masks. And so uh, we heard that a number of uh, weeks ago and uh, we're doing uh, what support we can do with those health inspectors to uh, help support educate uh, businesses and employees about what their roles and responsibilities are. So I'm, I'm glad you uh, spoke up Mr. Aitken. So I have a, sh a shop, I have an employee that now is going to call in and say that um, my, my co-worker is not wearing a mask and I consider this a public space because I'm a member of the public and I work here. How are you, what is your ruling or enforcement on that issue? Uh, so I'll start and I'll let Nancy finish. So uh, an individual's uh, perspective relative to whether they believe it or public, uh, it to be a public space or not is the first question. And our by bylaw has quite specific definitions uh, in regards to that. Uh, where, where there is a concern, where there are employees who agree to disagree relative to the use of masks, that falls under uh, Alberta Public Health and the, the public health inspectors with the gov uh, AHS have been responding to those sorts of complaints and dealing with it. Uh, with that, I'll uh, turn over to Nancy. Mr. Aitken, is a loading dock a public space? Uh, if, if it's, uh, if a, a person of the, the public doesn't have access, it's employees only, that use that space, then uh, under the definition, I'd say it's not a public space. So I'm a delivery truck driver backing up a truck, 
is he considered an employee of that company, or how do you explain this transaction? He's delivering goods to a back of a shop. So I think, Councillor Nickel, it's Adam. Um, I think uh, those are some of the examples that we certainly need to work through with businesses, and we, we know that there's going to be some education and some scenarios like you've just raised that we do need to ensure we work through, and we will. Um, um, at the start, we identified that if this is passed, uh, we will be spending um, considerable efforts to educate and inform the public around applications. Then if there's a, um, a citizen or a business that has flags or concerns, we will absolutely be there to support them in the application of this bylaw. My, my last question is, is, how do you plan to enforce masks on ETF? It'll be similar, uh, Councillor Nickel, to uh, when the health order, um, the restrictions that were put in place, we would um, start with education and awareness, uh, go to warnings, and then if, if required, um, we would go to fine, and that would be done by our peace officers. How much time do I have left, Mr. Mayor? I'm afraid uh, your time is up on this round. If you'd like, we can Thank you, sir. for another. Okay, uh, Councillor McKean. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A um, couple of things I just want to get out of the way, and I think I know the answer to these, but I suspect we might get these questions. Uh, apartment building, atrium, condo building, atrium, that's private space, right? So, Councillor McKean, again, it depends on whether or not the public can get access to them, so that if they are secure um, and it's just for... Um, small cohorts, I think you'd be fine. But where you can have other um, individuals that aren't part of the cohort, then we'd be looking at that as a public place. But if you had to be buzzed in uh, by a resident, that's not a public space, right? That would be my understanding. <laughs> that could get complex. Um, I, was, I visited the uh, emerging camp down in Rossdale last night and saw some wearing masks and some not wearing masks. One of my concern, and we've been criticized by our enforcement of people with no fixed address on transit, and, and I worry that we might be um, overstepping it with this too, if, we, if there are vulnerable people, people who would say, I can't afford to get a mask, what would be our enforcement response then, Mr. Aitken? I'll, I'll start. Um, oh. The bylaw is for face coverings, and it, it's not necessarily masks, so it does provide more choices. Um, and, and then I'll turn it over, Mr. Aitken, for, for, for addition to that. Uh, so certainly we, we understand the, the cost argument and the affordability piece. And so we've actually developed uh, a couple of other strategies, uh, both with uh, our rec facilities, with, with public transit, and with our peace officers uh, that we can uh, bring to bear in support of uh, those individuals that uh, we recognize uh, I can't afford them, but still have a need for a face covering. Okay, so we would, we would handle that with due care and compassion. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, I was in a shop yesterday and I, uh, there was a plea from the shop owners to pass this bylaw, which uh, I thought was interesting. They've been running into um, conflicts with customers over a shop policy that said, please wear a head cover or a face cover. And, um, and they were getting um, some angry pushback. And they said it would be better for them if it was a citywide ordinance and then they could sort of hold up their hands and say sorry it's <laughs> the city's rule on this so what which leads me to the question when you talk to the chamber did you get that sort of comment or were, was it mixed uh, we spoke to both the chamber and different BIAs and uh, I, I think they share that sentiment Councillor McKean of um, uh, 
um, consistent application makes it easier related to interpretation. Um, strong support from the chamber. BIA's identified a bit of a, um, cost implications for them in terms of passing along the costs and um, um, uh, a waste or, or, or dealing with the waste associated with uh, face coverings or masks. But I think um, a general support for a consistent application uh, across the city it, from, from our two touch points, which were the BIEs and the, and the chamber. Okay. Um, do you have any time left, Mr. Mayor? Uh, yeah, you got 49 seconds. Um, some of my colleagues have pointed out the nuance and complexity of this. What's a public space? What's not a public space? Uh, I do. I have heard, as I said, from business who supports this, and um, I think this will be largely about a further encouragement and setting a community standard around community and public safety. Uh, obviously, we won't have enforcement officers everywhere, but I think it's raising uh, knowledge and raising consciousness about the importance of protecting everyone's health. So I will be supporting this and I won't be speaking again on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Zadig. Thank you, I'm here. So Calgary had three times the number of cases when they chose to implement their bylaw. I'm wondering what metrics are we using to advance to each level? Mr. Aiken can supplement, but um, I'll reiterate, last week we identified uh, administratively moving to level two based on feedback from, from our patrons of city facilities. Um, this bylaw was a draft bylaw to be prepared and council uh, requested that it come for debate. But David, what are some of the indicators? So, so councillor, we have probably in the range of 30 to 50 different indicators over a wide spectrum of things that we uh, understand within Edmonton and what Alberta Health Services is tracking. But we've boiled it down to some to main key ones. And, and the active case rate is certainly one of those key indicators. And we have seen uh, recently an increase in that number. There was a, uh, a distance between uh, us and Calgary, but you know, we have seen a, a small bump, uh, bump in that. The community transfer rate is also a very key indicator um, uh, that, that tells us that uh, uh, AHS um, aren't able to track it. So that, that's another key one. And that's part of my uh, twice weekly meetings with Dr. Sakura and the pandemic team to learn about the Edmonton situation. And so there's a lot of other surveillance data that we use, but also uh, as previously mentioned, any support or recommendations from uh, Dr. Sakura or the pandemic team relative to the Edmonton situation and the uniqueness of, of the outbreak, because every outbreak has um, a uniqueness to it, and, and we try to understand that. Uh, but in but, addition, uh, we have seen an increase in the number of outbreak clusters. Okay, great. We're saying Dr. Sakura, though, but he's not recommending mandatory face coverings. But I, just to move this along, I'm wondering why we would not want to monitor compliance with level two before advancing to level three, uh, including a cross-jurisdictional scan, see what happens in other cities that, that may be slowly implementing this. It just seems like we're, we're jumping full steam on this without an understanding of what the consequences are. Why do we not, why are we going to level three before we're not even technically in level two? Well, so I um, don't want to sound like uh, repeating myself, but uh, administratively, we we went to level two based on the feedback from our patrons on okay. safe facilities. Uh, the Thank request you. was made for a bylaw to come forward. We had a draft, as we mentioned, to be prepared, and that's the discussion today, Councillor Zadek. I will say that the development of the bylaw has been informed by other municipalities and. Uh, the applications that they've made related to mandatory face coverings. Thanks. I, I understand that you're saying this is the first chance that we were had to, to assemble council properly to, to debate this. Um, okay, there's been a lot of reference to cohorts, and this was used in part to Council Max questions to sort of mitigate 
some of the, the concerns that are raised, yet the bylaw does not reference cohorts. It does not define cohorts. There is no mention of cohorts. And yet this seems to be a pretty solid part of the city's interpretation of how this bylaw would roll out. So I want to ask, what defines a cohort? Why is it not included in the bylaw? Can a person be part of more than one cohort? How long does it take to become a member of a cohort? For example, I witnessed a, a wedding this weekend and the bridal party acted like they were a cohort, yet I know that they had only seen each other recently for the first time in person. So can you answer those questions? Councillor Zadek, it's Ms. Andrzejczyk. I'll start and then ask either um, Ms. Jacobson or Mr. Aitken to add on to this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we can have um, can orders from the Chief Medical Officer coexist with um, a bylaw like this. And there currently is guidelines and as well an order around the social distancing aspect and allowing for cohorts. So that still exists and can be read to harmonize with this. Um, Nancy, did you have anything you'd like to add to that a little more specifically? Sure. So, Councillor Zadek, you're correct. Cohort is not a term that is included in the bylaw. The intention of, I, I would say, the cohort discussion is to help bring a bit of color to that public place distinction. So, if, if we're a public place and members who aren't normally resident or part of a, a very defined cohort would interact with one another, say in retail stores and shopping malls, that is where this bylaw would apply. But to go back to sort of Councillor McKean's example, in residential spaces where people are more likely part of a cohort, that isn't going to be a public place. So I'd say it's more of an illustrative example than a defined term we're relying on. How many cohorts can a person be a part of? There is no specific rule. The, uh, the premise, though, of a cohort are people that you interact with exclusively or on a very close to exclusive basis. How long does it take to become a member of a cohort? Is a new hire... Councillor, Councillor you're, you're, yeah. you've asked about eight questions, and they're good questions, but, but uh, we'll need to pick them back up on a second round because we're, we're well over already. So thank you. Um, Councillor... Sorry, I'm just looking at who's still on the first round. Uh, Councillor Esslinger is next, then Councillor Henderson, then Councillor Hamilton. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to confirm uh, something I had heard from the comments already was that the region, many of the municipalities around us have already or are going to a uh, phase two, um, but they're watching to see or where we are going to a phase three because they wouldn't want to be out of sync. Would that have been accurate? Mr. Mayor? Uh, that's what I've heard from uh, some of the mayors. Um, I, I think that there is a diversity of views among our 12 immediate neighbors about um, uh, the phase three question. It sounds like there's likely consensus on phase two. Uh, phase three though, I think um, where that goes in the region will, will not hinge entirely, but depend largely on where we go, just realistically based on what based on what I've heard. But again, that's not a hard and fast. That's that's my sense based on uh, chatting with a number of the different mayors. Thank you. And I'd heard. I just want to confirm that as overall business are supportive of that through the chamber, and I think you said the BIAs were a mixed review. I just want to make sure I understand my facts. Uh, limited engagement with business in general. Um, our engagement was with the chamber, very supportive, and with the BIAs, supportive, but they had some flags around implementation. Um, would it be them enforcing it? Uh, what would happen from a cleanup perspective? Um, uh, feedback that it's important that the municipality shows um, leadership and Mr. Ross is actually um, on the call. He could potentially supplement with more specifics if you'd like. Is there anything else, Mr. Ross? Uh, just, just that we did talk to each uh, individual BIA, and um, yeah, don't, I think uh, um, Adam has phrased it well. They are supportive uh, of of this bylaw from from that uh, from the principle of it. They just they did have some flags about 
um, some of the things that um, Adam just mentioned, but well, yes, we, and we spoke to each one of the BIAs uh, directly. Okay, because I've heard from some businesses who would feel this would reduce conflict um, if everybody had the same rules, but what I'm hearing, that's okay. The concern is about enforcement and cleanup. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. And, and some education that they would hope we, we would support with them so the customers understand. Okay, uh, and this next question is for law. Um, we're getting a number of emails about people's rights and if we went a bylaw would uh, violate their rights. Could you speak to that? Uh, again, I'll start and see if Ms. Jacobson has anything to add, but one of the exceptions that we put in here was if there was any protected rights under the um, Alberta Human Rights Act. And so that would include um, any type of statements, publications, notice signs, symbols, goods, services, accommodations, or facilities that are normally available to the public. And there are a number of protected grounds, the ones that would likely be the ones uh, that would come up would be uh, anything relating to religious beliefs. So if there was a reason someone couldn't wear a face covering for a religious purpose or physical disability, mental disability uh, might be the big ones. And I think we have talked a little bit about income, which is not quite a protected right, but its source of income is. All right, thank you very much. Um, and we did use a GBA plus lens, which is why we're using the word face covering to make it more accessible for everyone. Is there anything else that we've applied through a GBA plus lens? Um, good morning, Councillor. Um, we've also considered the, uh, the notion of religious um, rights and other rights uh, pursuant to the Human Rights Act and are, have ensured that the exceptions allow for folks with religious or cultural um, face coverings to be acceptable. Um, we've also considered the issue of folks who have experienced potentially trauma in the past in relation to face coverings and part of the education of our enforcement folks would include uh, that um, awareness. Thank you so much. Um, and the exit is December 31st, but it could be brought up each and every emergency advisory if conditions change. Was that what I heard, Mr. Laughlin? Um, it could be. I, I, EAC couldn't provide direction uh, on the bylaw, but uh, what I was highlighting is that there's regular touch points with administration on the current status of some of the indicators that we've talked about. Um, so I, I just indicated that there's regular touch points with council to revisit if needed. That would inform councillor in any of our decisions in the future. So That's we would correct. get regular updates. That's correct. All right. Those are all my Thank questions you. right now. Thank you. Thank you, councillor Essinger. Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, I just wanted to do a double check, and it was uh, I, I thought of this from uh, Councillor Nichols' question about the the delivery person driving up to a cohort, because um, it you know it strikes me, and these were some of the things that were confirmed by Dr. Sakura that the major advantage of masks is actually the reverse of what people are imagining that you can't protect yourself um, to be protected. The other person who may not be well needs to be wearing a mask. So it seems to me, in the example of of the delivery truck. Um, that if the delivery driver is to be protected, the person loading the truck has to be wearing a mask and vice versa. Um, that being the case, how does our test of public deal with that question? Because I, I think this is one of the things that's really confusing people, that it's not about a personal choice to wear a mask to protect yourself. The other person has to be wearing a mask for you to be protected. Um, and I, I think somewhere in that nature of how we define public and that interaction, it'd be nice to be able to capture that distinction. So do we think it does that? Um, Councillor Henderson, that example, probably many other examples um, are out there or, or that could be out there that require us to evaluate. I think businesses still have a responsibility related to their business operations. Um, and, and so the definition of public is if someone can enter that front door or that facility, uh, then it's mandatory or you need other 
uh, preventative measures like uh, barriers. Um, but yeah. but I, I, you know, for something like this and for many other enforcement bylaws, it, it does require a degree of iteration and, and, and working through it. Um, uh, I think this doesn't excuse businesses from making sure they have the right protocols in place for their employees, um, mm -hmm. if not specifically identified as public. But really, for this to be effective and to work, and I think we need to keep on saying this because I think there's confusion about it, um, it's about someone's right to be protected from another person who may be ill. And they can't protect themselves. They can only be protected if that other person is wearing a mask. That's that correct. really is the essence of what we're trying to do here. That's correct. And it's, it's effective if both are wearing, the most effective yeah, if absolutely. both are wearing the mask. Which, which is what you want. And then, you know, for the delivery truck driver, when the delivery truck comes up, everybody puts their masks off. The driver gets back in his truck and take his mask off. The loading bay person can take their mask down. Everything can go on. Um, and that interaction between the outside and the inside would not be impaired, correct? Ideally, that's how it would work, yes. Yeah. And that's what that's the sensible thing. So so, you know, I, I just I would just be interested, and maybe it's very difficult to do that in the definition of of when we consider public, but really public is about outside and inside interacting, I would think. Yes. It is. It's also uh, the, the the bylaw is around indoor facilities. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so so, so I, I'm just wondering if there's gray. So not wanting to muddy waters, and maybe this is something we need to look at going down into the future um, as we begin to understand. But I, um, is there a way to capture that sense in, in the way we define public and, and, and private? And, and is public and private the right distinction, I suppose, would be the other question, or is it cohort, cohort and ex external um, interaction that we're actually looking to try and capture? So it's Ms. Andrzejczyk. Um, certainly we yeah. can take suggestions from council um, on amendments with respect to the draft bylaw. Um, I do think the way we've worded it right now is very consistent and there is some value to having some okay. consistency. Um, and I think through education and other communications we can help provide some of the guidance to the questions that have been asked. I think as I earlier said, we're not gonna ever come up with the perfect definition for every situation and businesses will have um, some ability to also um, augment even what we're doing here should they choose to, and they, they can as it is right now. Yeah. So no, and I, I, I recognize it would be hard to do, so I'm, not, I'm certainly not suggesting, you know, I just, I ask the question in case there's a simple way to capture that, but I understand that it's complicated. But, so you, what you're saying then is the best way to, to deal with that is through communication, um, rather than necessarily getting overly in a key in a bylaw. And I think as well, what we've tried to do here is not duplicate what already exists in guidelines. So the province has provided some definitions around cohort in their guidelines. They've also provided guidelines for multifamily dwellings like condos and others where they have some space where they may interact. Um, and we have not tried to go into that or this bylaw would be extremely lengthy. Uh, but we can certainly help with educating and pulling some of these pieces together should the bylaw proceed. Great. Thank you. I'm out of time. Thank you very much. That was useful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation today. One of the sticking points for me continues to be the issue of enforcement. Uh, and so could you please help me understand I understood, sorry, as an example, when the pandemic began, people started calling 911 on seeing multiple people driving in a car together, um, which was never outlawed, but was significant enough for the Edmonton Police Service to issue a statement that they would not be enforcing on that. So um, throughout the pandemic, I understand that we've uh, put quite a bit of strain on our bylaw enforcement officers. My question to you is, this is an additional regulation. Um, how would you propose um, to keep sort of bylaw, um, how, how, how would bylaw have the capacity to in fact take up this enforcement? So, so if I may start, um, I think a hallmark and a foundational piece of any uh, bylaw enforcement uh, is 
ensuring that there's a good uh, education and awareness campaign. And we think by doing that, that really uh, heads off a lot of those those issues, concerns and complaints. While we do it, certainly expect to, to see a, a bump in those ones. Um, the next approach is obviously where they interact with any uh, city facilities or transit or retail. There's always that request for voluntary compliance. And once we get through that, then, then there's the the warnings uh, and as, as a last resort, the enforcement piece. And so uh, our approach would be to use a combination of both our uh, community peace officers, whether they be transit peace officers or regular peace officers, but also our uh, municipal enforcement officers who do a lot of work with the um, with the businesses. And so uh, as we did with the pandemic in those early days, uh, we went out and, and did a lot of um, site inspections and support and where those concerns were being raised by the business owners, we would contact our law branch, get clarification, and then, you know, uh, uh, provide that information to the to the business owners and those individuals that have those concerns. And so um, that's our initial approach. Uh, right now, we think that with uh, uh, after August, um, we will uh, increase our capacity because some of our other responsibilities uh, at Expo uh, won't be uh, continuing on in some respects. So we'll see a little bit of a clawback of those people. But again, um, right now, uh, we'll use the existing uh, resources that we have have available. But certainly part of our our plan is to understand um, uh, the information, data, anecdotal pieces about the concerns. And if there is uh, an inability to respond or growing areas of concern, we we go to our usual toolbox of some focused uh, level of support or uh, enforcement if that's necessary. And then again, if, if it's overwhelming and there's a, as in a need for additional resources, well, that's a conversation that in the report we said we'd come back and have that with council. And so I'm glad you brought up the communication education piece because we have a fairly tight timeline for the, the second phase. Um, that hasn't been enacted yet. Um, perhaps somebody in administration could tell me uh, more about the communication education campaign so that we're not requiring bylaw to go out and do enforcement? Uh, Councillor Hamilton, it would follow some of our other um, bylaw implementations that have been done in the past. It would follow the same process, but um, that hasn't been enacted yet because we, we need to ensure that council is supportive of the bylaw before we start to take those actions. So that would be work that would be initiated following uh, the decision that's made here today or subsequent meetings based on uh, council's decision on the bylaw. But it would follow a similar process that we've used for um, other bylaw enforcement uh, education and awareness campaigns. Okay, but you you obviously have some education plan for the um, city facilities uh, and transit piece, correct? You have some something that people are going to, so that they're aware? That's correct. It's, uh, okay. um, I'm not sure if Mr. Barkway is on the phone or Mr. Aiken can speak to the specifics if that's what you're, if, if that's what you're looking for. Um, uh, I just like high level detail. Uh, it sounds like we don't have. So, yeah. So, um, we, we had a meeting today. Uh, I think Mr. Robar is on the line. So they've got a specific, uh, campaign uh, relative to Edmonton Transit that will uh, heighten awareness both with uh, uh, getting on the bus and, and and different aspects and also with the recreational facilities uh, increasing not only our web presence on websites but also having uh, suitable uh, documentation and uh, messaging and signs uh, at those rec facilities when people come in to get the message before they but they enter so it's it's on a number of different fronts both um, with our push out through the regular media channels, but also site specific and uh, uh, additional signage in and around uh, public transportation. All right, Um, I don't know how much time I have left. I'm afraid the five minutes is up. I can certainly put you down for another if you'd like. Yes, please, thank you. Thank you. Um, Anybody else on the first round? Then I need a motion for a second round of questions, strictly speaking. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Second. Seconded by Councillor McKean. Uh, I'll seek unanimous consent on that. Is there any objection to a second round of questions? 
not seeing any, then let's proceed on the second round with, uh, so far I have Councillor Knack, then Councillor Banga, then Councillor Zadig, then Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Knack, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there have been other cities that have been doing this, some that are about to implement at Calgary, but Toronto and, and others have done that. Have there been many uh, conversations yet with those cities about what they've learned, uh, how they've adjusted based off how it's gone, or is that something we're planning on doing in the near future, uh, pending a decision here? Um, I have it specifically. I will check to see if Mr. Aiken and uh, Ms. Jacobson have. I know we've had some conversations with some of our um, abutting uh, municipalities, and we certainly have been talking to Calgary about mm -hmm. sort of some of the legal issues back yeah. and forth. And we've been tracking quite care closely what the other municipalities have done, where they've had ex exemptions, yeah. uh, the approach they've taken, as well as the fines and enforcement pieces. I, I guess the question, probably more for Mr. Aiken, if, if, if this were to pass, would there be value in reaching out to a City of Toronto to understand what did they run into as challenges and, and things that we may or may not have to prepare for based off their experience? Well, a absolutely, Councillor. Um, I, I think Toronto went in a, a slightly different direction relative to their, their business and the business approach in the bylaw. Uh, I, I think in Calgary, we are in contact, regular contact. Uh, and, and as you know, their, their council ha has done some fine tuning to their bylaw as we move forward. So absolutely, we'll be in contact. I, I think that's part of the, the whole process to understand uh, if this bylaw goes through, uh, where those rub points, where those pinch points, where some concerns are, and where we can increase our efforts relative to education and awareness and making it as smooth as possible. Or if, if it doesn't go well, then certainly we can come back and have those conversations with council. Sure. So that leads a little bit into my other question just around the flexibility. And, and there's, there's always a pro and con of having a bylaw that's, that's very prescriptive or one that's a little more loose. Um, this one seems to be a little more open-ended in the sense that we're creating clear exemptions, that we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to, that we're not going to be too heavy-handed in the approach, and we've heard that in enforcement. Uh, so is the way the bylaws are written in your mind flexible enough that it's going to allow you the opportunity to use discretion and, and make sure that we're not coming in in a way that's uh, too strict? Yes, and that's consistent with the approach that we've taken throughout this pandemic. Exactly terms of application of different uh, health orders that have been put in place. Yeah. Um, this is new for everybody, so we need to be flexible in how we um, interpret and apply this. Mm -hmm. The other uh, comment that someone raised with me, and I thought it was an interesting one, is because there, there are a lot of us using, you know, sort of the, the cloth face coverings, um, you know, this is new for a lot of us, and even just hygiene of how you want to maintain a mask, is that something we think we're going to be using as part of our communication? So not only is it mandatory, but just getting people to think about, you know, once you've worn it one day, you've got to wash it. <laughs> you don't want to be re-wearing it every day for seven days in a row. Yeah, a combination of what we've done already. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned last week that uh, Chris, Dr. Sikora actually participated in a video in terms yeah. of proper... Um, donning of the mask and, and taking the mask off. And also the province has done some um, education on mask uh, face coverings as well. So I think it will be using what's out there and supplementing it to ensure folks understand. And again, I, this isn't going to be instantaneous. It's going to take some education, some awareness and, mm -hmm. and building Absolutely. that up. Absolutely. Uh, we mentioned BIAs so are just looking for some additional guidance. So when we're talking about communication, do, do we plan on having, you know, we've created a lot of templates for uh, things that can be shared on social media. It's the idea we, we might create a, you know, a single sheet template that says, you know, bylaw 194408 it requires masks upon entry. Just something that can be used consistently by businesses if they want it. They don't have to, but it, it might serve as some help if there was a more consistent sign that they could put up on their door. Yeah, I think uh, um, Mr. E can, or Mr. Ross can supplement this, but I, I think those discussions have started with those business yeah. areas okay. to, to get an, uh, an appreciation of what helps them. Yeah, and, I, and that, may be, that may be helpful, it might not, so no need for them to chime in. I have just one more question, and I think you touched on it a bit in the presentation, but just wouldn't mind a little more guidance. Um, the schools and, and child care, um, we're leaving those out, creating an exemption, in the, and I think I heard you in the presentation suggest that you that the province is 
ideally going to provide some guidance at least there, which is why we're not including it in ours right now. That's correct. Okay. I think those are all my questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Banga? Oh, sorry. On the first round, uh, still, I've got uh, Councillor Katarina. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And uh, um, with the um, um, phase two or, or the comparison to Calgary and Toronto, uh, they have not implemented anything yet. Uh, I believe their bylaw uh, starts August 1st. Is, is that correct? It's Ms. Andrew Chick. So some of the other cities, uh, theirs is in effect. So Toronto's took effect July 7th. Um, okay. And, but Calgary's is August 1st. Okay, so there's a distinction there. So with the Toronto uh, uh, having been in effect now, what information have we uh, learned from, uh, from them that we are taking into consideration? Uh, because that is uh, extremely important. Uh, uh, to understand how things have been working. And it sounds like we don't have much information from them, or, or I could be wrong. So the, the Toronto bylaw, it, it's actually the requirement of the businesses to um, undertake this. What we heard mm. from our, our business community is that um, it's hard for them if they were tasked with that, uh, similar to what Calgary, uh, we believe Calgary has heard. So. In terms of this bylaw and the application, our closest comparator is Calgary, and we haven't had, as you say, it, it doesn't come into effect until August 1st, so we don't have any uh, information related to that. In terms of compliance in Toronto, we don't have that information, but certainly we can monitor that. Okay, well, uh, now with uh, the fact that uh, there, theirs is uh, different, uh, Calgary is the comparator, and they don't start until August 1st, uh, would it be reasonable uh, to uh, uh, go the two-week period and, and see how things work out with them. How critical is this for Edmonton to uh, make a decision today? I know that, uh, Adam, you re referenced this as that we asked or council asked you to bring this forward. This is not your initiative. Uh, this would be council's initiative to uh, move this forward from uh, phase two to phase three before we've even rolled out phase two uh, or implemented it, uh, that sounds a little bit, a little bit rushed uh, from council's perspective, uh, given that Calgary will give us a good example uh, in a week or two of how uh, uh, they've rolled this out, what uh, challenges they've had, and we can uh, uh, then work from there rather than trying to go to a phase three uh, prior to even rolling out a phase two at this point. That, Seems I, a little bit premature to me, but... I think that's an option that council has available to them, and I mentioned it in the speaking notes uh, in the presentation, that um, you could uh, do first reading and then um, hold on the other reading uh, readings of the bylaw and, until you've got some more information. Um, uh, administration's recommendation last week was uh, based on the patrons that, that we take that step as as if we were a business. Um, uh, this one is more public um, and I think it does, uh, it is in front of council for your consideration. I will say though that based on the engagement as I mentioned with the business community through the chamber and the BIAs is uh, feedback that consistent application uh, helps uh, and um, removing um, sort of that tension from them enforcing as part of their private business does help them as well. So there are, there are some, um, biz, there is some business feedback that, that it, it, it would be helpful. Uh, but again, your approach uh, is one that could be considered Councillor Katarina and um, it, it could be as simple as uh, completing first reading and then holding uh, for additional feedback on how it's going in Calgary and how it's going with our application at level two. Okay, well, that to me sounds uh, much more reasonable uh, is to uh, gather that information and, uh, and start with phase two and see how that uh, works for the next couple of weeks. Uh, I hope council understands that as well, too, that uh, uh, no one is against protecting uh, anyone else, uh, uh, but uh, we have a, an opportunity here now to uh, work phase two uh, and see what... Uh, 
falls out, uh, good or bad, and uh, fix what's bad uh, before we move on to a phase three approach. Uh, uh, so I, I would prefer uh, refer this back to administration to wait that two week period, uh, get all the kinks out of phase two, and then introduce phase three, and hopefully council uh, would see the benefit of, uh, of that. But uh, uh, I'll leave it at uh, I'll leave it at that. I have no more questions. Uh, there's not been nothing compelling uh, to change uh, uh, moving this forward. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Caterino. Um, let's finish the questions, if you don't mind, and then if there are mm -hmm. process motions or uh, referral or anything else, we can come to those uh, after we've completed questions. So, carrying on on the second round, uh, Councillor Banga, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, is that for me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I missed uh, the name. Uh, so in Toronto, uh, the businesses are responsible for, uh, for this bylaw. But in Edmonton, we're proposing that it is the individuals that are responsible for, for compliance. I, uh, I just want to understand better. Why is that? So, Councillor Banga, what Toronto and a few of the other cities in Eastern Canada seem to have done is their bylaw requires the business and the business owner to have a policy that is publicly posted uh, requiring patrons to wear a face covering. Um, and then they have some of the exemptions, but they also have put in there that um, if somebody falls in the exemption, you shouldn't really be asking them why they're not wearing a mask. Um, they also didn't stipulate what any particular fine would be. Uh, and then separately in Toronto, their um, transit commission also passed um, uh, an order or bylaw that required people on their transit to wear a mask, but then they also indicated they would not enforce any fines around it. Um, I think where other cities like Calgary and where we have gone is to say it really is an individual requirement to wear the mask as opposed to putting that on the business to um, have to enforce. So the difference is who would actually be fined potentially. So in our situation, it would be an individual, whereas in Toronto, it would potentially be a business. Thank you. Uh, it's been said again and again that uh, our efforts are going to be gaining compliance through through uh, education awareness the, if passed the way it is today uh, we would uh, only have three days to to do all that education and awareness do we think that's enough time to to uh, basically uh, let everybody know that is it uh, it is uh, is it doable for us? Well, we recognize, Councillor Benga, that uh, it won't be instantaneous. Uh, if, if it's August 1st, then um, it's the start. And, and this it will be similar to some of the other tactics that we've used in the pandemic. It will be an ongoing journey of education awareness and ensuring that folks understand. So, um, like we've said before, we're not going to be out there with peace officers on August 1st handing out tickets. We're going to be um, doing everything we can to make sure folks understand, if passed, um, what this bylaw means and how, is, how it's applied. And we know by some of the examples that have been raised that we'll have to work through some unique situations and support not only the public but the businesses that are involved. Okay, um, I'm sure the way we are going is probably the best way to go, but should the compliance rates do not increase, are we in a, are, we, are you going to be bringing us uh, a budgetary uh, uh, item adjustment? Um. I mean, obviously, with yesterday's announcements, um, we're in a, a better position. Uh, if there's a requirement for um, 
I'm not trying to choose my word carefully here, but stronger or more thorough enforcement. Um, like some of the other costs related to COVID, we'll be tracking it. And if we hit a point where we need to do an adjustment, uh, we will be re-engaging with council around what those pressures are. Okay. Um, and my next question is about religious gatherings. Um, there are going to be, I guess, during face coverings of some sort now under this bylaw, if that happens. Um, uh, could you be able to tell me that, uh, are they still required to maintain that two meter distance in addition to the face coverings? So Councillor Banga, the Chief Medical Officer still has an order around the two meter distancing and also has some guidelines specifically to places of worship. Okay. And uh, my next question is about, uh, um, again, um, multiple businesses have contacted me about uh, some people say it's a good thing, some people say it's a bad thing, so people are mixed. Um, with this December 31st uh, end date, as it is proposed, what needs to happen to end it sooner? I mentioned this earlier, um, if the province um, initiates a mandatory face covering um, public health order, uh, we would likely recommend repealing this bylaw. If um, some of our indicators, both macro and micro, are um, indicating that we need to repeal this bylaw, we would bring that back for a discussion with council. Um, and it could be at the direction of council um, leading up to December 31st, 2020, um, to repeal the bylaw. Um, to extend the bylaw, it would be the, the same approach. Okay, my last question is, uh uh, we are allowing uh, uh, bars, restaurants, they would be exempted from this bylaw, uh, both indoors uh, and maybe even outdoor patios. Is that is that true? They're not exempt from this bylaw. They, they're not, so... Uh, what, what, what is exempt is when mm -hmm. you're eating. You have to take your mask off to eat. Okay, but uh, if you're just drinking, it's okay. Then you have to have a face covering. If you're consuming anything through your mouth, you have to take off your mask. Oh, definitely. And uh, when we are uh, uh, having this, um, I guess, uh, mandated uh, face covering, um, outdoors when somebody is grocery shopping, but indoors uh, they're about to eat, I know they can't do it. Does it look double standard to you? Um, so if, if in a restaurant um, there are guidelines that have been created by the province and businesses have, um, um, from what we've seen, uh, followed the guidelines or or actually taking it a step further with their particular business um, processes or protocols. Um, and, and in the case of, of partaking in food or beverage, um, um, I think the, the comfort level we have is that those businesses are following those protocols and that does support uh, the relaxation within that particular case. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Next up is Councillor Zadek. Thank you, just starting my timer. I still have questions about cohorts, but I don't want to burn through this whole round talking about them. Uh, I, I get the administration's comfortable not having a definition in the bylaw, but I just wonder why there's no reference to cohorts at all in the bylaw. Partly because Councillor Zadek, we're, we're covering off the public component of this definition or application of cohort is through the guidelines and the interpretation of the private businesses. What we're trying to cover off is the public interface with businesses or indoor public facilities. 
So are you saying businesses interpret what a cohort is? Based on the guidelines that are provided by Alberta Health, yes. And so is it a new hire in an organization part of a cohort on day one of employment? I can't comment on how a business would interpret that within their particular activity. Previously, you referenced a council as a cohort. Why do you think that we're a cohort uh, in the, under this definition when we have not met in person in four months? Um, like, if we were to assemble in person, would we have to wear masks? I, I think uh, it might have been Councillor Knack's question, and it was around um, in chambers. Why, why would we not have to wear uh uh, uh, face covering and the answer was that currently this isn't accessible to public and also it has other barriers in place specifically the plexiglass that's between each of us and then in the case of administration certainly between Miss Andrichuk, Miss yeah. Armstrong and I uh, we are we have considered ourselves a cohort along with other members of administration. Okay we had Dr. Sakura present when we were debating receiving information about administration's uh, move to bring us to level two, in my interpretation, Dr. Sakura was hesitant about that. And I'm just wondering why we don't have him present while we're talking now about level going to level three. Um, respectfully, I would say that Dr. Sakura uh, wasn't hesitant. He was actually, he actually indicated that this is a, a good step um, in terms of level two, in terms of why he's not here today. Um, administration has provided the information related to level two and level three, and this is really a decision point for council. Uh, we felt like the information provided by counselor, or counselor, <laughs> Dr. Sikora, um helped inform the decision for today's meeting. Okay, so at restaurants and bars, you do not need to wear a mask if you're eating or drinking. So. It seems to be standard practice in our culture that a glass of water is placed on the table as soon as you sit down in a restaurant and it's the last item to be cleared um, after payment of a check. So in effect, would you agree that no one will be wearing masks while sitting at a table in a, a bar or a restaurant? I think as they enter the facility, I would assume that they'd be wearing masks as they sit down and get into a table that is served um, in a way that follows the Alberta Health Guidelines that uh, I would presume that they would take off the mask. This bylaw, um, through previous questions, isn't intended to be uh, black and white. There is some interpretation that's going to have to be applied um, in this bylaw. But as they're walking down the street on the sidewalk, they don't have to have a mask on. They would have to put one on as they enter the restaurant and then if there was a beverage present, they could take it off? Well, I think once they get into a situation where they can adhere to physical distancing and uh, the provisions that are provided by their restaurant, um, I would assume that they could. If they're not comfortable with those settings based on um, how we've you know, developed the, the bylaw, uh, they can choose uh, another facility that maybe does have um, better guidelines or, or, sorry, better protocols in place from a restaurant perspective. Okay, what's the cost of this bylaw, education and enforcement? And if you're saying there's no additional ask for cost, I would ask you what other bylaws will not be enforced while we are trying to enforce this bylaw, while noting that, that you're going to be delicate with the way that you enforce this, but it's going to take up a lot of human resources. So, so we what's don't. Your we don't have specific costs, Councillor Zadek, but we are tracking. Um, this is something that's categorized as COVID-related costs. And so we are tracking that. And as I mentioned earlier, should we find that uh, we don't have the resources to support the effort that's required to either educate, uh, build awareness, or enforce this bylaw, uh, then we would be having a budget discussion with Council. Okay, I'm out of time. I'll request a third round. Thanks. Noted, thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Um, one of my remaining questions is about the physical and mental limitations. As I think you've said, Ms. Andrichuk, um, uh, there's provisions in other 
jurisdictions that you can't ask about those limitations. Um, and yet, uh, not all limitations are visible. So how does administration imagine it would deal or enforce the use of masks in these circumstances? So thank you. I'll start on this and then perhaps get Ms. Jacobson to um, add some additional comment. So again, we've left it relatively silent in this bylaw um, rather than sort of setting it up so that a business owner um, would make those inquiries. Um, and again, look to see if our initial phase of compliance works sufficiently without needing to take additional measures. So again, this is a bit of a step-by-step -step process um, in this. It also then still allows, if needed, um, bylaw officers you know, could ask, but again, our, our first starting point would be just to see if we get general compliance, and in some cases it'll be relatively obvious if someone is unable to wear it for one of the um, protected grounds or other reasons. Nancy, did you have All right. to add? No, I would say that this is a speaking more to enforcement practice than a strict interpretation of the bylaw. Um, officers and any member, any business owner could remind about the requirement and a person can self-identify with that exception and we would follow through with the appropriate amount of discretion. So that's one of my concerns is that we then put it on people with mental and physical limitations to self-identify their medical condition um, and someone else may here, uh, you know, it, it, there's a question of privacy there. Should they have to be identifying um, themselves? And, uh, you know, what if someone declines to share their medical condition with a business owner or bylaw enforcement officer, and yet they're perfectly allowed the exemption? Um, were they to share that? Uh, how, how do you propose to navigate that situation? So, so if I may, um, that, that question certainly has come up. Um, we've been looking at that through a, a GBA plus lens. We actually have uh, got a couple of, um, uh, I won't say solutions at this point, but a couple of points that to address that question on how they can do that respectfully. And so um, we're, we're just working through whether that's uh, workable or not. So hopefully within the next uh, little while, we'll have, uh, have those that might answer that question. All right. Um, I think Cam Councillor Councillor Hamilton, it yeah. does it does mean some judgment from our our folks that are working, and that I think is echoing what uh, Mr. Aiken is saying is that we do not only need to educate our public, but we also need to educate and ensure our staff are prepared for this. All right, thank you. That's uh, the balance of my questions, and. Uh, just to add that I support what Councillor Katarina has uh, suggested. Thank you. Councillor Zadek, uh, or pardon me, are there any other questions on the second round? Can I get a motion for a third round? I'll move that. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Second. Seconded by Councillor Zadek. Are there any objections to a third round of questions? And then by unanimous consent, we'll uh, commence a third round of questions. Go ahead, Councillor Zadig. Thanks, and I'll do what I can to try and make this my last round. Um, I'm just really trying to understand this bylaw, and I would support referral, and I, I might have some amendments that we can talk about um, when the time's appropriate. But I'd, for the bylaw, as presented, I want to know why we have not chosen, sorry, why we did choose a date to end this versus uh, a different metric like the number of cases. Um, and I know we've talked a lot that we do have a lot of metrics, but my concern is we're not measuring these metrics in any way that I can tell. There's no benchmarks like say a certain threshold of cases being exceeded or, or dropping down to a, an acceptable threshold. So. Why did we go with the date route versus metrics and benchmarks? Councillor Zadek, it's Ms. Anderchuk, and again, I'll look to Ms. Jacobson. I think having, um, there are a couple options that we could have done. We could have left it open and then had amendments as we needed to if council wishes to repeal it. 
This was just to provide some certainty and to bring it back within a period of time. Um, that does not preclude council from asking for additional information to reconsider this at any point, I think as Mr. Lachlan mentioned in his opening remarks. So if council felt um, the indicators were shifting and they wished to amend uh, and alter the bylaw or the time that it would extend for it, that would certainly be within your uh, <coughs> responsibility and powers to do. Okay, thank you. It was referenced that BIAs sounded largely or at least partially not interested in this bylaw. I can let you know that I also reached out to the North Edmonton Business Association and they don't really have a stance on it, but don't seem too keen. They are not to BIA. But usually when you provide a report to council, you provide the results of surveys and other supporting information and appendices. Just wondering why we were not presented with the results from the BIA discussion. Uh, we did provide a, a bit of an update in the cover report, but quite frankly, Councillor Zadok, this was a weak turnaround for getting this bylaw in front of you. It sounds like you were rushed then. It, the, the bylaw itself has been drafted, but the engagement that had happened had been limited to BIAs in the chamber. Okay, and that also sounded like our city solicitors answer to the last question about why we chose a date versus number of cases. So I'm not going to ask any more questions right now. I'll support, I either have amendments or I would support referral that may be able to have my amendments uh, considered in that. So Mr. Mayor, I'll leave it at that for now and uh, seek your guidance about accepting amendments or if, well, you know, it, I'll put a referral motion on uh, as soon as I have the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, I see more questions. Um... Uh, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you, Administration, for uh, putting this forward uh, for us to talk about. Um, just to back it up a little bit, just to, I guess, cleanse the palate, what is the purpose? Why are we here? What? Why are we having this discussion about possible face coverings uh, in Edmonton? Uh, short answer is we're in the middle of a pandemic that we've never experienced before and um, masks through literature review and support from the chief medical officer, if worn where you can't physical distance, uh, do help prevent uh, the spread. Right, and some people will say, um, but masks, you know, only stop, you know, 0 0.3 microns or whatever it is, and the virus is 0 0.1 microns, but the virus is carried on uh, on moisture, on water droplets, right? That's correct. Yeah, and so masks are effective. It's fairly effective at stopping water droplets, correct? That is the rationale behind this, and to Councillor Henderson's earlier comment, it's... It, a face covering is also around the the opportunity to prevent for those that can't prevent. I'm not saying that really clearly, but uh, I think I Councillor, understand. Councillor Henderson has articulated it quite well. Yeah, and so what we're really talking about is, and just to, to reiterate, because I want to make sure I'm clear, because I'm hearing a lot of uh, discussion here, but we are trying to reduce or... Uh, or to keep from increasing the number of infections so that we don't overwhelm our healthcare system so we don't have to shut down the economy again. Yes, we do not want to overwhelm the healthcare system. Right. And that would be bad, but if the economy got shut down again, what would be the uh, impact for our city? Well, we're, we're just in relaunch. Um, sort of mandated, not mandated, but guided by the province and supported by local specific um, support that we're providing to businesses. Um, and in other municipalities and areas, um, the second wave has, has stunted the economic recovery. Now, if we had a, a sudden spike because we decided not to do anything, um, how would businesses fare? Well, if we uh, presumably we'd have to shut down again, 
we'd have to have things uh, closed up because we couldn't risk uh, a massive uh, infection spread. So would they be able to uh, weather this storm easily? Yeah, that is the risk, and that is a concern, I would say, for businesses. And that, um, from our perspective, should all be guided by uh, Alberta Health through the direction of the chief medical officer. And the resulting impacts are things that we would need to do as a municipality to support um, ensuring that we minimize stunting the economic activity that's happening. Right. So while this is a health concern, what we're also looking at here is a business concern, an economic concern. And if our economy isn't functioning well, then that's harder for people to put food on the table. Um, our vulnerable populations have the potential to grow in number. And so really what we're talking about is taking a prudent, responsible approach to keeping uh, what has been an unprecedented pandemic in check in Edmonton. And the fact that our numbers are low right now speaks to the moves we made earlier. And this is just an extension of those prudent moves. Is that correct? I think that's fair to say in our direct, um, uh, um, sort of, um, interaction with that is the feedback that we heard from our patrons on city services that, there is a comfort level or um, a desire to go to mandatory face coverings. And um, we're also hearing it in general from the public related to this. Uh, but we do hear um, both sides. But certainly when it came to city services, which do support specifically transit economic recovery, um, it was uh, um, uh, strong feedback from the patrons that uh, um, this would help in terms of their uh, their comfort level in using that service. Well, I believe I'm out of time, but thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, so first reading is before us, and I've heard two different suggestions. One is pass first reading and then refer. Uh, I've also heard make amendments uh, and then refer. I've heard refer with direction to uh, make changes, uh, and I've heard proceed today. So um, I'm not sure um, where to steer from there, uh, but I think Councillor Zadek had indicated a uh, desire to make a referral at this time prior to consideration of first reading. So uh, I'll go back to him. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will re move referral. I just got to get to my right screen here. So this is how it, it would read while well, noting that the date, I'd be, it'd be friendly for the date to be changed. So I, what I'm saying is that bylaw 19408 be referred to administration to return to the August 17, 2020 City Council meeting with any potential amendments which have been learned from the experience of face covering bylaws in other Canadian municipalities and learning from the implementation of phase two in Edmonton. Second. I was. Okay. So I think Councillor Nicol got the second on that one. So does administrate, uh, do the clerks have the, the wording of that? Uh, we, it is now in the chat, and we will also get it up on the screen. We're just going to stop the display here for a sec. Okay, so uh, to learn from the experience of face covering bylaws in other Canadian municipalities and learnings from the implementation of phase two in Edmonton. Uh, okay, so... Number two, yeah. Yeah. So uh, referral is on the floor now, and do you want to introduce that? I will, and I'll be brief. I, if other councillors were listening to my questions, um, that is sort of the, the avenue that I want administration to explore. I would just also state that I'd have more comfort if the doctor was here and um, if we had data about the Edmonton experience in phase two and other comparable municipalities invoking a similar bylaw. The Toronto example doesn't seem to be apples to apples. And I also understood that administration seemed a bit rushed and not to put words in their mouths but the consultation could have been a bit more thorough and i think it's important that we do this right in order to ensure success and 
a, a few weeks delay might just be the right thing to do. That ends my uh, my introduction speaking to. Okay, thank you. Um, I have uh, Councillor Knack and Councillor Paquette and Councillor Banga with, uh, with questions. Councillor Knack, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, uh, I think just one, I think the, the question for me is, uh, if this were to proceed with all three readings today and come into effect August 1st, I think it would also be fair to guess that if there were any amendments based off your learnings, based off other cities, based off our experience, you would also bring those to, to the August 17th meeting if you felt they needed to be adjusted. That's correct. Okay. So there is a, so the, really the debate is whether we want to, to hold off on implementing this and do that or start the process and then adjust on the same day. That's how you would interpret this? Based on that okay. motion, I, I would agree. And I've answered before that I think there are going to be iterations of application based on local or business yeah. specific like with situations. virtually every bylaw we do there's there's always adjustments or, and changes and that's we correct. want to try to get it as close to right the first time but we we also make adjustments as that's correct be. okay uh i won't go on to speak mr mayor I, I won't support this only because i think that we can have those same adjustments on august 17th and i'm comfortable with the information that's been presented so far to make a decision today on this so i won't support the referral thank you thank you councillor knack um I think Councillor Paquette has deferred to Councillor Banga here, so I'll go to Councillor Banga next. Mr. Mayor, a procedural question. If we give it the first reading today and uh, then um, go on to, uh, I guess, uh, do the uh, find the findings of other municipalities, would not it accomplish the same? Um, I guess the results? If there was, well, it's difficult for me to answer that. Because um, until third reading is passed, the bylaw is not in effect. The value of dealing with first reading and then referring it back is that it's still amendable before final implementation. Um, and then there is no risk of not being able to proceed with the other two readings at the other meeting. There, in this scenario, there's still a risk of getting to the 17th and only being able to do two readings. However, there's a, a council meeting, um, I think the next day, uh, where we would be able to put third reading on. So it's more procedural uh, gymnastics, so I, I suspect that there's more politics to um, not wanting to have to vote on first reading today since the bylaw in, in some folks' estimation requires additional work. So, so the, each is procedurally valid, uh, but the motion has come now before first reading has been voted on. Thank you. My question has been answered, and I'll speak when it's appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Thank you. Um, just administration, is there, is there anything, uh, are there any recommendations from health officials that we deal with that say that the risk of infection and the risk of uh, growth in infections has decreased since uh, March? Uh, no, everything. Everything from a data perspective has been an increase. The one exception that we monitor is the uh, number of cases within the homeless population, which has thankfully remained at zero. Okay, and, and that's because of the great work that you did, so thank you for that. Um, you know, I understand uh, you know, the, the desire to wait to get more information from other jurisdictions about how they've, the issues they've had or the challenges they've had, but from a health perspective, a health concern and the impact it would have on our economy, um, are there reasons uh, based on the science uh, to delay this kind of move of face coverings? Uh... So like, does science say, you know what, 
wait a few more weeks because we're not really in a serious situation with this pandemic. Well, uh, I, um, yeah, this is a tough one to answer. I know it's a because, tough question, but... Um, um, so what I would say is that based on the indicators that we have, based on um, the province's um, desire not to go to mandatory face coverings and the fact that they are the provincial health authority or the public health authority um, and, and that our cases are not as bad as other municipalities, um, those are factors that weigh into the decision whether this is the appropriate step or not. Um, level two for us was an appropriate step because we had heard directly from those that use our service. And again, if we were a business and we heard that feedback from our patrons, we would recommend taking steps, which we actually did. So this one is a, is a tougher one because it's really the, um, the tension between the public health authority saying that it's not mandatory, but strongly recommended our cases not being as bad, but the curve is still rising as other municipalities, uh, but also the, the the proactive steps that step that this is to ensure that we do everything we can to flatten the curve. So um, that's why it's a tough one to answer, Councillor Paquette, because I think yeah, no, I, and I understand. I'm sympathetic to that because I mean, I could ask you if there are politics motivating that advice, but there's no way for you to actually answer that. So I understand. Um, okay. I, do I have any more time, Mr. Mayor? Is that it? Uh, I'm afraid that's time. Okay, but those were questions, so you can still speak. Uh, uh, if you want me to add you to the speaker's list. So. But I'll, I'll proceed now. Um, and uh, I think everyone else is... Oh, no, Councillor Katarina has questions. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just on uh, the referral motion and that, and a lot has been said today, uh, probably the most uh, about education and how this would actually proceed regardless of, of what we do. So uh, if we proceed with a bylaw, you're going to educate. Uh, is there intention to educate regardless of a bylaw? That seems to be the most reasonable approach for me is to actually continue on with a comprehensive plan which we didn't get for phase two, we don't have for phase three. So that for me would be uh, uh, the mandatory part uh, would be to actually roll out a comprehensive uh, education plan regardless of, uh, of the bylaw. Mr. Lachlan? Yeah, well for level two, Councillor Katarina, we are undertaking education and awareness campaign because we are actioning that. Um, okay, do we have a com comprehensive plan that we can actually see? Because that hasn't come forward to this point. And can we get a comprehensive education plan uh, for a phase three if that uh, uh, comes into effect? Because everything, everybody has stated that we will not go to enforcement, that we will educate first, so, uh, regardless of this referral motion, uh, is that education plan on the table to actually go ahead and do it? So, we, given, didn't, we didn't want to be presumptuous it. that the bylaw uh, would pass or not pass. So, uh, until it passes, um, we aren't actioning an education plan for the broader mm. mandatory face coverings. Are, okay. We can certainly share with so you some me, of the tactics that we're using to educate and aware and make awareness for our level two application, and we can do that via memo uh, following this meeting. Okay. I guess I'm not getting my point across. So uh, we we uh, if this was to pass the implementation, uh, the first stage uh, would be education. Uh, if this bylaw doesn't pass, we're not considering educating the public on the necessity or, or the reasoning why uh, face masks are um, recommended by Alberta Health, recommended by us, uh, why wouldn't we uh, move forward on the education, wait the, the, the referral period to see how uh, phase two is actually working 
uh, with the education plan there and then make uh, a final decision on uh, on this because uh, I think uh, you know some of the questions have been is this political sounds political isn't political uh, it's all a matter of uh, perspective and uh, if education is the way you would go to actually implement this bylaw why wouldn't you just implement education regardless of, of a bylaw or not uh, I think that is the most reasonable approach uh, and would send the message that we concur with Alberta Health uh, that this is strongly, strongly recommended and that enforcement is way out there uh, that would be extremely problematic anyway. So let's take the proactive approach that education is the way to go and let's do that. Let's mandate that that you actually uh, educate the public. So we do have education that's happening. It's basically channeling the direction or the education and awareness that's coming from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. So um, to suggest that we aren't doing that um, is, is not correct. We are educating that it, it is recommended when you can't physical distance to wear a mask or a face covering. The specific uh, awareness and education is as the application of the bylaw is initiated that we wouldn't take a heavy hand approach with the bylaw, nor would we take a heavy hand approach with the implementation of level two. And so the actual awareness happens um, as the activities are happening. So the education and awareness of um, the face coverings is from the chief medical officer of health. And we do reinforce that when it comes to specific education and awareness, it's related to specific actions, which are, the level two implementation, and if approved by council, the the implementation of the bylaw. Okay, I understand that, and again, I don't think I'm getting my point across. If we're going to implement the bylaw, uh, but the first step is to actually educate uh, before uh, enforcement at any point, why wouldn't we educate now, regardless of uh, uh, of a bylaw in place or not? Counselor. If that is the most important step. Councillor, I think it's challenging because it presumes that we will pass the bylaw, which administration can't assume. But on the broader point of echoing the advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, Adam and I have both done that at every media availability. And I think that the material that's been posted around city facilities and public transit all echo that, that call. So I would suggest that that education has been uh, ongoing and consistent since March. Respect. Okay, has it been effective, Mr. Mayor? Given the circumstances we're in now, it, it sounds like we are saying that the education that has gone on has not been effective, and that is why we need to mandate uh, a certain action. That's what it sounds like. Well, I'm not going to debate that with you, Councillor. Uh, Specifically, I think we'll come to that through the question here. So, um, okay, so with the, I'm afraid your time is up. Okay, Councillor, um, let me just see. Are any of these? I don't have the list in front of me. Are are these questions? Or are we all into speaking now? Does anyone have uh, questions? Not hearing that uh, any of the folks on the list are for questions. My computer keeps going to sleep on me here. So, okay, so I think we're down to uh, speaking to referral now. Then I have Councillor Walters next. Go ahead. Thank you. You can hear me fine? Yes, we can. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. So, uh, I will not support referral, uh, and I would like to support three readings of this bylaw today. Like I said last week, being asked to wear a mask in August is like being asked to stay home in April. Uh, and in fact, if we could go back to January or February, we would uh, likely start uh, locking, would have likely started locking things down earlier. So learning from that, I think we can be proactive here, uh, recognizing that uh, not every part of this bylaw is perfect. Uh, so I'd rather err on the side of caution, minimize the health and economic carnage of a looming second wave. And I have no doubt that it is looming. 
And respectfully, I think fussing around over every little interpretation, uh, communications, education, and enforcement detail is simply a lack of leadership. We can make a strong statement here, and if we pass the bylaw, most law-abiding citizens will follow the rules, whether they're, they're crazy about wearing a mask or not. Dr. Hinshaw said last week during one of her daily updates, uh, she said, if you're watching this right now and not wearing a mask, Please start today. Uh, so that sounds pretty mandatory to me, uh, coming from the, the sort of uh, uh, pr- most prominent public health voice that we've uh, listened to throughout this pandemic. Uh, so let's just make it so here in the city of Edmonton. Uh, this pandemic is awful. We're all tired of it. Full stop. Uh, wearing a mask most places we go. Uh, is awful, will be awful too, but I think it is the right thing for us to require. Uh, so I just want to thank Admin uh, for turning this around quickly and for the reasonableness that you've applied to the possible application of this bylaw. Uh, so I will not vote for referral. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Henderson? Uh, yeah, I, I I agree with that. I, I think, uh, you know, I think... I actually don't think they were legitimate. I think we moved pretty quickly in in uh, in the spring on this, but there were certainly criticisms that other countries and other areas had moved faster. And in retrospect, we may have wished we closed some things before we actually did um, in order to get on top of it. Um, I think we have an opportunity to learn from that lesson here. Uh, you know, I, I would argue from an education point of view, um, Alberta Health has been saying wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask for months now. Um, And we're not getting good compliance on that. Um, The education has been out there and is not being followed through on. And and, and I also think we have to recognize that it's much harder to do this in a provincial context, to be fair, um, because the situations in the larger, more compact um, urban centers is very different from some of the rural areas of this province. It's It's not an apples and oranges kind of thing. I think in our context, this makes sense. I think we have to recognize uh, we've had it a little bit easy over the course of the summer when people can be outside way more than they want to be, uh, the way way more than um, uh, uh, than they will be in a month or so. And if we can get ahead of this uh, before we all go back inside and get this built into people's way of being, I think it could save us um, some much more major grief in the future. And I and I, I think it's also worth just remembering, and I know I keep on saying this, that you know, from the personal if this was about personal choice and I could protect myself by wearing a mask, I think that this would be a slightly different question. But when I put a mask on, I'm not protecting myself, I'm protecting everybody around me. So if somebody else makes the personal choice not to wear a mask, they're not putting themselves at risk, they're putting me at risk. And I think that's what makes this question uh, much more important, that if we really want um, masks to be effective, they have to be widely used. It's not just enough for that person who, who may feel at risk from a health point of view wearing a mask in the hopes it will be effective for them. They will be far better protected of the person who is out there, who may be asymptomatic but is carrying, if that person is wearing a mask. And I think we can only get there by getting mask wear, right, wearing, um, wearing way up and the only way to do that, clearly, having now for six, seven, eight weeks encouraged people to wear a mask, strongly encouraged people to wear a mask, and not seeing high compliance, I think the only way to do that is to mandate it. So I, I think we need to get on with this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Essinger. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate uh, Councillor Henderson's comments about why education isn't enough. Uh, I I think masking is essential in combating the second wave, so I'm not going to support referral. I think to put it down for another three weeks um, when we have an opportunity to make a change now. We've heard from uh, Dr. Hinshaw that we are no longer flattening the curve. So for me, it seems to make easy um, decision to move forward with doing it sooner than later uh, I was open to hearing for a couple of days if people needed a bit more information, but three weeks is far too long for me. Uh, masking for me is about respect and respecting one another. As a community, we've come together, we stayed home, and 
And now as a community, we can come together and keep one another safe. And I think that's what this does. We've heard from the chamber, we've heard from various BIAs, and I had a meeting with my one of my BIAs, strongly encouraging masking to support the work that they're trying to do. Um, and I think we've heard from the region are looking to see what we're trying to do. I think it's our responsibility to, um, to look at how we can move forward. And I was out with my grandson and we were wearing masks and he said to me, why, why isn't everyone wearing masks, grandma? Don't they care? Um, I do care for one another. And for that reason, I am going to uh, not support referral. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Again, uh, like a lot of other folks, I am extremely divided on this thing. Um, we are in unprecedented times, and and these are uh, in the wake of uh, COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, global pandemic. As a local and global community, we find ourselves in uncharted territory. To be frank, there is no tried and true playbook on how we can best manage and mitigate the spread of COVID. But as a municipality and community, we are adapting and adjusting as best we can because Edmontonians have proven that they value the health and safety of their fellow neighbors. We have quickly learned that there are different parts and phases to our COVID-19 response earlier this year. And the expectation was that in order to best protect against the spread of virus, we all need to do our best by staying home, wearing face covering masks. In the recent months, our healthcare system's capacity allowed us to slowly but surely reopen and relaunch. But things are far from being normal. And the threat of COVID-19 still remains and the rise in Edmonton, rise of cases in Edmonton and Alberta demonstrates that. Uh, Dr. Hinshia noted uh, the curve in Alberta is no longer flat. We need to do more. We need to do better. It is recommended that the Chief Medical Officer of Canada and Alberta that uh, wearing masks will help reduce the spread and rate of infection. I understand that there are some who believe that uh, the reports on effectiveness of the face coverings to, spread, uh, to step, stop the spread of COVID-19 are exaggerated or inconclusive. But at the end of the day, there are no reports that suggest that face coverings increase the risk of infection. The same cannot be said for choosing not to wear a face covering or mask when social distancing is, is impossible to be maintained. <clears throat> I believe that this is a necessary step and we need to ensure that the health and safety of our citizens is protected. It may not be easy, it may not be popular with everyone, but it is necessary and it is temporary. In my opinion, the more we do, the better off we will be in the future. And we are not the first jurisdiction to uh, mandate this, and we won't be the last. Um, again, I would like to um, uh, to uh, just do it today, uh, give this bylaw three readings, and not in support of uh, um, deferral. I'd rather uh, err on the side of uh, safety than going and then just trying our luck. And uh, so we'll not support referral. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nichol. Councillor Nichol. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I wasn't, I wasn't on the list, but uh, I'll speak really quickly. Uh, I think, to be quite frank, 
uh, this is the province's call. This is not City Hall's call, uh, in my opinion. I am not a virologist. I am not a doctor. And if Dr. Hinshaw and the province have not mandated masks, I think it's an overreach. And so at, at what I've heard out of Calgary is the confusion that's being created in the workplace has caused a lot more stress than it has aided. And so that's simply my, my point of view on it. I, I think waiting to see how these things work out, because the devil is in the details. I think the unintended consequences are going could be very, very uh, uh, traumatic for the economy. And no one's arguing about safety here. We, we all want to be safe, and I'm totally supportive of masks. I wear them. My kids wear them. My wife wears them when we go out. So that's that's not the issue for me. And with regards to the buses and so on and our property and that we operate as a city of Edmonton, that I have no problem with as, uh, as well. But here, at the end of the day, when we step into the private realm, uh, people uh, operate running their businesses and just trying to get by. Uh, they, this needs to be handled very, very carefully, and this rush uh, to do so uh, seems rather, well, to me, rather reckless uh, when we can just wait and just see a couple of weeks to, to see how things are going. Now, Councillor Zydek spoke very eloquently about the need for metrics. I asked about this months ago when I said, what does the exit look like? And here again, we are guessing what the exit is going to look like, what the metrics are required for, uh, for performance. And in defense of this council, this is, should not be our call. This is the province's call to mandate masks, to mandate these health protocols. It is not ours. Uh, we, we, we have a different book of business and that we should take care of. So that's all my comments. I will support referral, and uh, I would hope others would as well. Thank you. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, you know, yeah, of course, uh, it would be great if the province were to make this call, but we know that they punted it to us. And so we are left holding the bag and left uh, having to make this decision. And we know from uh, watching other jurisdictions around North America, when a smaller jurisdiction has made the move to mandatory masks, but the rest of the area or the larger uh, jurisdictions have not, um, that puts them in a very uh, awkward position where even one has actually reversed their decision because if they're the only ones doing it, uh, it makes it very difficult to maintain. We happen to be in a different situation being the massive jurisdiction in our region. And so by making this move, we make it a lot easier for the smaller jurisdictions to do the things that they want to do and that is to prevent the spread of the virus so that we can keep the economy moving. If we don't have a healthy functioning economy, we don't have jobs. There's no money to pay for anything. So barring a complete reimagining of what an economy is or looks like, this is what we've got. And so to protect the ability to ensure that people are able to keep the walls from the door and to keep vulnerable community member numbers down as much as possible, we all have to do what we can to keep our society and economy moving. And if this minor frustration for some folks to have to put on a mask when they walk into a, a, a store is the cost, it's, very, it's a very minimal cost compared to uh, a massive second wave that would devastate local business, which I will not uh, support doing. I don't think that there's uh, any justification for ignoring the science that we already have to wait a few more weeks uh, while we fiddle. I will not sit on my hands on that. So this is what communities do. We protect each other. And as things open up more and more, the risk of infection increases. Our numbers have been low because of proactive preventative measures. This is an extension of that effort. We've said from the outset that the sign of success here will be that people will look back and ask if we did a little too much by way of caution. That means that we were able to keep numbers low. One thing that gets lost over and over again is the exponential way this virus can spread, and that is that you can be asymptomatic, asympt showing no symptoms, 
but be infecting others without even knowing it. We want to keep hospitals in a position where they can handle cases as they come and are not overwhelmed. This is key. Exponential growth of the virus would overwhelm hospital capacity. As we've already seen in multiple other countries, we do not need more science. It's there. We do not need more observation. It's there. If we want people to remain free to go out, to go out in public, this is the move we have to make. Of course, outdoors, no face covering is required, but once indoors, the risk of contagion is more present, as medical professionals have told us over and over ad nauseum. The bylaw addresses various exemptions, so there's no worry about that. Various needs and the ability to adjust according to those needs. There are also t- timelines here, and we are following metrics. The metrics are there. That is the, the metrics are very clear. What is the rate of infection? What is the percentage of infection? When those go down to an acceptable level where there is no risk of a, that spark creating a conflagration, then we know we will be okay, and eventually there will be um, a cure. So this move should increase confidence in our communities. It means they can go out, they can shop, they can uh, have a little more uh, confidence in the economy. And so to me, what this comes down to is, yes, it's a health decision, but it's an economic decision. This is about jobs. And I will not support delaying this because personally, I want to protect jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Um, I want to say that this has been framed as a discussion about science, and I don't think anybody is disagreeing on the science in this. Why I support referral is because this, uh, as other councillors have noted before, we have not yet implemented uh, the directives of phase two yet uh, before we're implementing phase three. And I am not satisfied. I think administration pulled together a really good report in a very short period of time, but I'm not yet satisfied that we have the capacity uh, to effectively deal with this bylaw. One of the unintended consequences I see is that in the medium term, we undermine our ability to, in fact, bring in this kind of uh, bylaw because it's messy, because Um, It's not clear on what the jurisdiction is. It's not clear on what can and cannot be enforced. And my fear is that we will undermine our own authority uh, to the detriment of later and more necessary health measures. Councillor Nickel isn't wrong. This is not our jurisdiction. And Councillor Paquette isn't wrong either. Other jurisdictions have found that when smaller uh, municipalities implement something or counties, Um, then uh, it sort of forces, um, it forces others to take, um, to take measures. Now, one of the things that has happened, say, in the state of Texas, is that when count, that a whole bunch of counties um, introduced their own measures. Now, why the state of Texas stepped in was because one county had a certain set of parameters and another had a completely different set, and it created a lot of confusion Um, going between different areas of the state. So then the um, state, the governor had to step in uh, and also, I think at that time, reduce the penalties for it. If the province has no intention of stepping in, we have the the potential here to create very confusing um, differences between jurisdictions. Um, I think it's... I don't disagree with wearing a mask and I agree with what many counselors have said with respect to what that means in terms of your personal responsibility for the wellness of other people. Um, But I also don't see the harm in taking a pause. We're already implementing it in phase two uh, and seeing uh, what sort of challenges we see before we introduce implement a full bylaw. Um, I think that there is damage that can be done in haste. And I've always been a proponent of somebody or of taking it slowly and seeing how um, our, you know, the impact of the laws that we're about to make. 
Um, so I will be supporting referral. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack, you've got the note. You don't have referral on the floor, so you can take the chair. Yes, I'll take the chair. Okay, so um, for starters, I believe we can help uh, stop or at least reduce the severity of a potential second wave by taking this step. Uh, not referring, that is, but taking the step of passing the bylaw and passing the bylaw today. So I won't be supporting referral um, because I believe we have an opportunity and, and even three weeks um, could make the difference. Um, it is on a, a precautionary basis. It is on a proactive basis. It is on a preventive basis today. I would not want to be in a situation on August 17th where we're looking at first reading going, oh, I wish we'd done this a week or two ago. Um, but at least we got the wording right. Because we can change the wording on August 17th. We can come back August 10th and change the wording if we really need to. Um, I think we have already the benefit of hindsight from several other jurisdictions who've done this. An administration has, has built this bylaw with reference to that. And again, Mr. Lachlan has suggested that if it does need to be changed, it can be. Um, I think the biggest challenge for our public and for businesses and even for us as decision makers through this whole five months has been mixed signals. And no doubt there are jurisdictional mixed signals, uh, international mixed signals around best practice, uh, but it certainly seems that those jurisdictions who have taken the step of widespread masking are doing better than jurisdictions that have not. And that has helped them keep their economies open, helped them keep their uh, healthcare systems from being um, overwhelmed and saved lives. Seems that simple to me. I, I don't understand why we would make it more complicated than that. Because I think the mixed signal that referral says, given that there seem to be two camps arguing for it, one camp says, well, let's make sure we get it perfect. And, and I, as a recovering perfectionist, would say, let's not let perfect be the enemy of good, would be my answer to that argument. The other argument is, well, I don't want to deal with it today, and I don't support it, but let's refer it so that I can vote against it in two weeks or three weeks. And so I, I think we should just make the decision today. Um, and if you think the bylaw needs work, we'll come back and do work. If you think it needs changes, make amendments. But let's put it in place. If you think it shouldn't come into effect until the 10th of August because you want to make an argument that there should be more time for people, uh, more lead time for people to uh, prepare for it, you know, I think there's plenty, plenty to debate in the bylaw itself. Um, delaying these difficult conversations to the 17th, which, by the way, is a pretty packed council meeting as it is, uh, I think most importantly misses the opportunity to send a clear signal because those mixed signals have contributed to the inconsistency uh, of, of widespread adoption and left particularly small business owners in the same situation the city of Edmonton is in, which is going, will somebody please make a decision here? The best advice is for everyone to wear masks, but heaven forbid anyone should make a rule because hot potato, I don't want to make the rule. The small business owner says, well, if I make the rule, the business goes next door. The small municipality says, well, if I make the rule, the business goes to the next jurisdiction, which is why I've argued for a long time it should be the province, at least on a metropolitan scale, making these decisions. And the premier said again yesterday, in cities, it makes sense, and we defer to their local authority. So we've clearly been empowered to make this decision. It is within our mandate to make this decision if we choose. And we are hearing from businesses that they believe, not universally, nothing's unanimous these days or ever at the best of times, but certainly not now. But we're hearing from many businesses saying, would someone please make a decision? And even from some of our own neighbors in the region who said, it'd be a lot easier if you make the decision than we could follow. But we can't do it on our own without you. So somebody's got to take some leadership. And waiting three weeks to do so, I think, is an abdication of that leadership and our responsibility 
under these extraordinary times. So obviously I feel strongly about it. I wouldn't have called this meeting if I, if I didn't. I frankly think we should have done this some time ago. So the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is today, not three weeks from now. I will not be supporting referral, clearly. Take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Anybody else before I go to Councillor Zadig to close? Councillor Zadig. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, with this bylaw, I think it, it needs more work than just uh, some wording changes. Um, fundamentally, I think we can do a lot better. There's no references to benchmarks as to, sure, there are metrics that we've talked about, but no benchmarks as to when this should be implemented, the mandatory donning of masks, and when we can discontinue this. Um, I think that we need to get to level two in earnest before we talk about level three. That will give us the time to get this bylaw right, which in turn will make this more effective. And a gradual rollout of mandatory masks will aid in education and acceptance amongst our population. And that is what is required in order to, uh, to fight this, this virus and be effective in our approach. I know that those that want to bring this uh, bylaw into effect today are coming from a good place and, and they think that this is just some uh, tough love for Edmontonians, but I would advise that in my opinion, I think that this will backfire. It will not be effective. The way to do this is to get the bylaw right first. We, on uh, August 1st, we're having the mandatory masks in city facilities and on transit, and that's a good move. Uh, Rushing this right now is going to have unintended consequences, and I don't want to be responsible for that. So I hope you all support referral. Uh, I noted when I introduced the motion that I'd be it would be a friendly amendment if someone thought August 17th was too late, but I think we do need to see what's happening in Calgary for at least two weeks, and this would provide that opportunity, and we can do this right. So I hope you all support the referral motion. That's all. Thank you. We're nearing the break, but I will call the vote on referral. Yes. No. So that's a yes from Councillor Nickel and a no from Councillor Walters. We're just loading it into MMSX, Mr. Mayor, and I'm going to turn the display on for the Google Hangouts. Okay. Two seconds. We're good to go, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Please display the vote. And referral has failed with Councillor Walters, Councillor Banga, Councillor McKean, myself, Councillor Assinger, Councillor Cartmel, Councillor Henderson, Councillor Paquette, and Councillor Knack in opposition, and Councillor Zadix, Hamilton, Katerina, and Nicole in favor. So um, I see some folks have uh, conflicts over the lunch hour here, though there's some will to extend, but we still have a bit of debate ahead uh, of us, so I'm going to suggest that we observe orders and um, reconvene at 1.30 to carry on with debate on first reading of the bylaw. So um, we'll be in recess until then. Thank you.
We'll roll call in about a minute. Councillor Nickel, just to confirm, are you on the conference line? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Hey, Lane, I'm here now. Oh, thank you, Councillor Walters. Thank you. I just had to retry from scratch. Thanks. Welcome to... Uh both of you on the line, Councillor Walters and Councillor Nickel. Uh, I will start the roll call now. Uh, this time starting with Councillor Banga. Present. Welcome back, Councillor Zadik. I am here, thank you. Hello, uh, somebody's uh, no. unmuted in the background. Uh, sorry, if you could all mute and unless you're responding to the roll call, please. Uh, Councillor McKean. I am back. Great, thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Present. Hello, Councillor Katarina. Yes. Welcome, Councillor Essinger. Present. Hello, Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Henderson. Yep. Welcome back, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Welcome, Councillor Nichol. Present. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. I'm Live present. and in the mask. Uh, Councillor Walters. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you all for coming back, and I'm here as well, obviously. So, um, <clears throat> reconvening uh, on first reading, uh, which is still before us. Uh, I think we had exhausted questions on that. Um, so, and I think we more or less got a chance to speak to it this morning, but uh, strictly speaking, there's still the opportunity to speak to first reading if anyone wishes to. Anyone wish to speak before I go to Councillor Knack to close? Mr. Mayor, uh, is this for first reading of, of 4.1? Correct. Okay, yeah. Um, just very quickly, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Just, I'm frankly shocked that this is, um, is a debate, but it is. Um, this virus doesn't care if we get this 100% correct right out of the gate. Uh, this virus doesn't care if we have a second wave and a lockdown. But I do care. This is about ensuring safety and the health of our local economy. So this vote is about protecting local jobs and our families. It's about restaurant workers, fitness trainers, and so on, all people. And so that's what I'm voting for today. I'm voting to keep the, this virus at bay in the extremely low numbers that it is right now. Because we know that one spark can cause a fire just like those old you know dams in the netherlands one leak can cause an entire collapse and that's not something to play with so if we have tools at hand that are not onerous tools that will help us to ensure that we remain economically viable then we should use those tools and that's what i'll be voting for today Thank you. Thank you.
Anyone else before I go to Councillor Knack to close? Going once, going twice, Councillor Knack to close. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, uh, and sorry, I, I only briefly spoke during the referral piece, and so I didn't uh, offer too much in terms of commentary, although I think there were a lot of great comments that have already been, so I don't think I'll take the entire time. Uh, I just I actually wanted to take a moment to acknowledge uh, some of the voices that we've been hearing over the last little while that have been con have had concerns. Uh, having talked with some of the people directly, and um, I did a live virtual event last night or last week. Uh, there's there's a fear that this is sort of the beginning of something that's going to be far more extreme about this about sort of government control in in their everyday lives and. And some of that comes from a place of, of, of legitimate, I actually felt that they were, they were, had some legitimate points and concerns that they were raising around why they, they didn't want to see this go forward. I think there were also some concerns raised that, that maybe weren't as, uh, as compelling, but uh, for me, I just, I thought it'd be worth just mentioning that I think the way this bylaw is written, I think will actually provide a lot of folks with more comfort because not only do we have the timeline built right into the bylaw, which was something I heard from those that had concerns that, that they would feel more comfortable with, um, even if they didn't love the end result. Uh, and then the other piece is knowing that we're going to have multiple opportunities to check in uh, through the emergency advisory committee, through council, and keeping a close eye on the, the various measures that uh, Mr. Aitken and all of our administration are, are watching quite closely. So uh, I, I think for me, the reason I, another reason I, I feel confident that this isn't sort of that slippery slope down into this, this uh, overbearing government piece is that this is a very unique situation we're in. And, and the situation's probably the wrong term because what that situation is is that it's a pandemic that we're in. And it's unlike anything we've lived through in our lives before. And the challenge is, is that this is really only seven months old, and, and for most of us outside of China, it's only really four months old for a lot of us. And I think it feels like a long time for a lot of people, even though this is actually a really short amount of time since this got started. And we can't forget that we're learning new things every day. The studies early on were not as clear about the benefits of something like masks and face coverings, and I think the studies now are much more clear about that. Uh, it's, it's less a debate about whether they're effective, it's just a debate about exactly how effective they are. And, uh, and so I just think we need to keep that in mind as we go through this process. When it first started here a little over four months ago, there were a lot of quick decisions made, in most cases by our administration, to try to prevent um, any widespread, widespread of this virus. And I thought they did a phenomenal job of being able to react uh, to this situation that we've never been through before. And I think you just mentioned it before the break, Mr. Mayor, that actually in this case, when it comes to face coverings, we're probably a little behind in, at this point. With, with the studies that are out there and what is clear, and so I think it is time for us to act, knowing that in two weeks' time, we may get new information. We may learn something entirely new that we never knew before. And like we've been doing the last four or five months, we should be, continue, be willing to continuously adjust and adapt based off the best information that's out there right now. So for me, that's, that's why I am supporting this. And I, and I also echo what Councillor Paquette talked about, I remember listening to some of Calgary's debate around that, that concern of if you're taking this step, using this tool, what that can do to help ensure that you're not seeing another shutdown. So I think Councillor Paquette summed that up uh, quite well, and so I won't repeat it other than I just want to echo what he had, had noted. I think it's really important for the viability of the city going forward that, that we take the step. And, and I give, want to give credit again to Councillor Walter's line last week, which uh, actually resonated with a lot of people that I spoke with around that. Wearing a mask today is the staying home of, of April. And I think a lot of people, when they heard that, were able to take a step back and realize, yeah, this is just one small step we can take to help make sure we're working together. So uh, I'll be supporting this. I'll support all three readings today if we have that opportunity. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. No. Yes.
That was yes from Councillor Walters, Mr. Mayor. Yes from Councillor Walters, no from Councillor Nickel is what I heard. Mr. Mayor, uh, yes from Councillor Banga. My okay. old part doesn't work. Okay, noted. Mr. Mayor, I've got 12 votes. We have 13, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, and display the vote. And that is carried 10-3 with Councillors Walter, Banga, McKean, Hamilton, myself, S Councillor Essinger, Carmel, Henderson, Paquette, and Knack in favor, and Councillors Zadik, Katarina, and Nicol in opposition. Mr. Mayor, I'll move second reading of bylaw 19408. Second. Please vote on second reading. No, Council. Councilor Walters, yes, Mr. Mayor. So Councilor Nickel, no. Councilor Walters, yes. Councilor Banga, have you got the, the bot working again? It's working. Yes, for Councilor Banga. Okay. We've got 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Display the vote. Same result as before, 10 to 3. Mr. Mayor, I'll move consideration of third reading for bylaw 19408. I will second that. Good. Please vote. Yes. Yes. On consideration to allow third reading to proceed requiring unanimous consent. We've got 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and display the vote. And that is carried unanimously. Mr. Mayor, I'll move third reading of bylaw 19408. Thank you, I'll second that. Please vote on third and final reading. No. Councilor Walters, yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. We're good to go, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Display the vote. And that is carried 10-3 with the same division as the previous readings. Okay. Um, that concludes item 4.1. A uh, bit of information yet to receive in 3.1 uh, on the broader COVID situation and uh, changes around the Expo Center. So thank you for bringing this information forward. Um, might have come as a memo, but I thought it might be useful for council to get it this way and to be transparent about, uh, uh, as, as transparent and timely as possible with the public about information being shared with us. So thank you for uh, spending a few extra minutes here on this meeting uh, to help us uh, understand what's afoot. So please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the comments I'm providing uh, are specifically related to the Expo Center and uh, the closure update. Um, Susan McGee is on the on the virtual uh, meeting to support and answer questions as well, along with uh, other staff. As part of the City of Edmonton's COVID-19 response, a temporary community support facility for Edmontonians experiencing homelessness was established at the Expo Center with support services provided by Homeward Trust, Alberta Health Services, social agency partners in the City of Edmonton. The Expo Center provided day services for up to 500 customers, including food, showers, washrooms, laundry, sleeping areas, tax filing, housing support, and medical services. Isolation services, including 24-7 shelter for those experiencing COVID-19 symptoms while awaiting test results and or are COVID-19 positive, were also made available. 
Funding was provided by the province for both day and isolation services. Homeward Trust allocated a portion of federal funding for the day services as well. The decision to wind down the facility's day program on July 29th came at the culmination of key events, the end of provincial funding, the end of the state of local emergency, and the need for the Expo Centre to resume normal function. The plan for relocating these services has been a collaboration with our partners. For isolation services, the city is working with the operator, Boyle Macaulay Health Services, uh, Government of Alberta and Alberta Health Services to explore options. A preferred location is, has been identified and Alberta infrastructure is currently in negotiations with the facility owner to lease the space. The new location will not be a drop-in site, rather AHS will transport symptomatic clients to and from the site using AHS vehicles and drivers. The city along with the province, Homeward Trust and our social agency partners are in the process of assessing the feasibility of additional day, services, day service sites. These include City of Edmonton facilities, warehouse and office spaces, private buildings, former schools and temporary tent structures. Administration has reviewed 30 to 40 different locations in support of finding a suitable location. City facilities, government facilities and private properties continue to be evaluated and ranked. A preferred location for day services has not been identified as of yet. Physical distancing requirements have required all social agencies to adjust their capacity and service models. Day site capacity is anticipated to be approximately 150 spaces, significantly lower than pre-COVID levels. The city recognizes and appreciates the immediate pressure that the closure of the Expo Centre causes and it has been working with our partners to identify solutions to serve our vulnerable populations. We understand that the Boyle Street Community Centre is looking to expand onto the sidewalk outside their facility with a picnic tables so more clients can receive service and the city is working to expedite the use of road right away to support this effort. The Edmonton Public Library is working very closely with the city to explore an outdoor activation of library services to customers on Sir Winston Churchill Square. Efforts are on track to start this service after the long weekend and have it scalable. Uh, that concludes the quick update on this item and available to answer any questions. And again, uh, Ms. Susan McGee is on the, on the call from Homer Trust uh, should uh, sh uh, she need to provide more specifics. Thanks. Well, thanks, Mr. Lachlan, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. McGee, for being with us here as well. Uh, I'll start with Councillor McKean and then Councillor Katarina. Thank you. First of all, the Expo Centre decision was largely a funding decision then. We'd run out of funding. That's uh, one of the um, drivers. Uh, the other one, as I mentioned in my notes, is that um, the activation of Expo Centre for um, events has, has come up as well. So we would, we're actually contemplating large events in the Expo Center. My understanding is that uh, EDC or, sorry, I'm not sure if they've officially changed their name yet, but uh, um, that version of tourism and convention are looking at utilizing the Expo Center for events. So I was, I visited the uh, volunteer supported camp down in Westdale last night. Um, somebody's not on mute. Um, and I, I, I wonder if that is a symptom or side effect of, or even um, an indication of what's to come, that we're going to see a lot more of these um, camps in the urban realm and how we're going to deal with that. I would hope that we would have a compassionate and even supportive response if we're not able to give indoor facility space for some of the needs of these folks. Uh, absolutely, uh, that will be our approach, Councillor McKean. Um, Mr. Jevney, I believe, is on the call and he's actually been, uh, he and his team have been in conversation with uh, the group that's out at Rossdale. Um, and our approach is to understand um, their needs and they are being supported and um, 
that we would work to uh, um, accommodate them respectfully and and with compassion. Yeah, what I heard was, so I think they've cobbled together some money for porta potties, so portable toilets, maybe even a portable um, shower facility would be, uh, that's what they talked about is, is their needs. Um, also, of course, if we're going to, We've talked about this before, and it was an idea that came up before to have a supported or supportive um, camp to deal with folks that were not going to stay in shelters. And I suspect now that our old shelter system does not have capacity either because of the need to social distance. So I suspect, I hope I'm wrong, that this is a sign of things to come and that we're prepared for that and prepared to deal with it in a way that is not heavy handed. Ms. McGee, do you have, you were in a meeting, I think there was a meeting yesterday of social agencies and others around this whole issue. Can you give me your thoughts on what our, what our next stage or next step are gonna be around uh, this if we see a lot more champion? Um, I wasn't personally in the meeting. I had a number of uh, staff and support staff in the meeting, and we've been certainly connected to the advocacy work that is ongoing. And I, I would say that um, in terms of the earlier discussion about um, managed encampments um, and some of the challenges with that, we've been hoping certainly that we would find some alternative space. And in fact, 24-7 Shelter with day services would be ideal, um, but it is something that once these um, circumstances evolve, I absolutely agree. We need to ensure that we have a strategy that supports their health and primarily safety and 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 health um, and health from um, you know a very different lens in this pandemic environment. So there has been a lot of collaboration in the past around encampments and and. Um, I know those relationships. Everybody's still meeting about that, but with the added complication of a pandemic. Um, context and that's going to require um, some additional you know changes to how how we support that but i am also still i think um you know really committed to and we continue to try to look for alternative spaces during the day the challenge of course is that we need so much space um in terms of square footage 24 7 shelter would be an amazing thing which we've never had um the uh, getting this third hand but that in fact, Calgary was getting funding for the next stage of their um, vulnerable person response, and that Edmonton had not yet. Have you, you, do you have any information on where we're at in securing any additional funding from senior orders of government to help with what could be a crisis? I can comment on the two um, things in front of Homer Trust right now. We have an application and there is an expected second um, flow of pandemic response dollars to the federal government. However, they did a call for proposals. We've submitted to that um, a number of priorities, including day services and street outreach uh, were included in our submission. But right now, as of last week, they've indicated that they've prioritized some other um, areas where there's more prevalence of, um, and at the time, I know things are changing very quickly in Alberta, but they prioritize some other community projects, but their response was they don't have a definitive response. In terms of um, Calgary and Edmonton, I think the, the kind of, as of last week, there wasn't a commitment to Edmonton, and I know that there was asks um, around uh, budget and treasury nothing decided, and whether something has been decided in Calgary, it may have to do with um, the actual determination of a location and an actual budget. And that's been a challenge for Edmonton, other than, as has been mentioned, um, the isolation shelter. Um, and, and that has been prioritized and shelter has been prioritized as the province generally um, has been very focused throughout this on uh, their role of supporting the shelters in the phase two. Mr. Mayor, I suspect I'm out of time. I'm afraid so. Thank you though. Uh, Councillor Katarina is next. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Lachlan, uh, your update uh, on the isolation center. Can you uh, please clarify the role that Edmonton will be uh, playing in this, uh, who the lead uh, proponents are? And uh, we'll start with that. The isolation center is... Uh 
uh, Boyle Macaulay Health Services, the Government of Alberta and Alberta Health Services. Um, and they're working with Alberta Infrastructure to secure the space. Um, and the operation would be by AHS uh, in partnership with those that I've mentioned. And they would manage the uh, transportation to and from that site. Okay, uh, so uh, in short, uh, Edmonton is only playing a uh, supportive role in uh, a supportive role. Uh, there, there is uh, nothing that Edmonton is doing uh, uh, itself uh, to lead this uh, project. That is my understanding, but a fluid situation. So we're always uh, staying plugged in to see if there's anything that comes up from a city of Edmonton perspective. Okay, as of yesterday, I, I was uh, assured that the City of Edmonton is only playing a supportive role, in, uh, uh, but yet uh, they have no, uh, 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 nothing to do with the lease uh, being contemplated, the location that uh, is actually has been chosen, and I don't know why you left that out of your presentation, Mr. Lachlan, uh, on uh, the location that has been chosen already. I did say that um, a preferred location has been identified and Alberta, right. Alberta Infrastructure is currently in negotiations with the fac facility owner to lease the space. Right. So you're not in a position today to publicly uh, state that location that has been identified? Um, I don't believe so because there's currently in negotiations. And it's, it's not our um, facility, so it's not our announcement. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Sorry, Mayor. sorry, it's not our facility. Uh, we can say that, so it's not our announcement. Right, I understand. That's why I asked the first question on yeah. the involvement of, of Edmonton. It's not our facility. We are not the leasee. Uh, we are not the leaseholder. Uh, we are strictly offering moral support uh, for what uh, uh, the province, AHS, and uh, others are, uh, are doing. That's correct, but again... Uh, as we've learned from this, there are um, things that do come up, so we're staying plugged into that in the event that the City of Edmonton does need to support in some way. Yeah, moral support at this point in supporting it. Uh, the uh, um, Isolation Center, uh, without going further into any detail, uh, can you uh, clarify or confirm that we're talking about uh, 20 people on any given day we're not talking about the drop-in center like the expo with hundreds and hundreds on a daily basis can you confirm that uh yeah it's much lower numbers in the isolation that's varied through throughout the time that it's been in operation and mr eakin can probably provide more specifics if you're looking for that well it, it, it just confirming that it's going to be around 20 people versus uh, hundreds of people david uh, so, so uh, councillor, just yes um, or no. That's all. Uh, well, I mean, I my I was my part of the presentation yesterday, so I I'm aware. I just need some confirmation in public uh, on our involvement and what we're actually talking about uh, when we're saying the isolation center. That uh, there are no comparisons to the expo center compared to this being stood up. So, so there, there, are, there are two separate uh, programs at the Expo. This is the isolation wing. On average, yes, you could say it, it's 20 people. Obviously, it has to be scalable based on the outbreak, but this is in no way the same as the day drop-in centre. So on average, yes, we saw that as low as 10, um, as many as in the, in the high 20s, but we, we anticipate right now 20, and we certainly don't anticipate any of the numbers that were experienced for day programming because it's it's a it's a different resource, a different support mechanism. Okay, and I understand as well too that the process uh, in choosing the location, uh, as many as 30, 35 were looked at, uh, but I didn't get a clear sense of uh, of, of what was being compared, uh, like the metr metrics on on how this site was uh, chosen versus other sites and. Uh, like I can't say any more than that, obviously, uh, if it's not our announcement, but uh, uh, are you certain that it, uh, the 30 locations or plus 
were all uh, equivalent of each other? Uh, certainly, the, the review of all of those locations uh, went through the same vetting process. What we can say is that Alberta Health Services has a, um, a, a list and a criteria relative to the, the things they need to be successful from a medical support perspective. We looked at uh, both city facilities, Government of Alberta facilities, private facilities, and, and other offerings, uh, and we looked at it through the same viewpoint. We put all of that through the steering committee, and right now the location that's pending uh, is uh, the, the lead on all of those locations. Okay, and again, Thank just you, to Councilor confirm, Katarina. the city of Edmonton Sorry. is not the Councilor, lead on this. That's correct, and I'm afraid your time is up. Councilor Banga? Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, with the deactivation of Expo Center, do we have enough capacity to handle both the isolation and the daily visit folks? I guess the isolation was probably around 24, 25, and uh, others uh, were probably in the 400 to 500. So short answer is uh, yes to the health isolation and no to the day programming for um, the, the numbers anticipated needing a day program service. And part of the reason is that the, the, the restrictions on space, um, or sorry, uh, the physical distancing restrictions have created a space constraint, uh, which is why we're continuing to look at options for um, supplemental space for day programming. Okay, so uh, is it coming on uh, August 1st? Sorry, uh, what, what's... The, uh, deactivation of Expo Center, when is that going to happen? Uh, for the day program, it's... Uh, um, sorry, Mr. Aiken, can you help me out? Uh, end of this month. So the, the anticipation is that by August 1st, that, that'll, the day program will have ended. Okay. And the isolation section would still remain? Uh, right now, uh, it's contingent upon the negotiations that they're having between um, uh, infrastructure, Government of Alberta, and uh, the, the, the landowner. And if, if that is successful, there's a contingency that we may uh, see a continuation of that medical support within Expo for up to two weeks while those final negotiations and the transfer takes place. So we do have uh, two weeks, uh, I guess, grace period just in case things don't go as planned. That's correct. Thank you. And uh, I also uh, heard from... Uh, presentation that uh, uh, the people are going to be transported from the shelters to the hospital by by the AHS, is it? That is uh, the current plan. AHS will transport symptomatic clients to and from the site using AHS vehicles and drivers. Okay, so with the procedures for uh, identifying the people who are not showing any symptoms. Are they going to be implemented in some way or fashion? Uh, do you mean transportation for those that are looking no. for the use of day program? No, before we transport and before those folks are uh, allowed to mingle with uh, everybody else. I apologize, Councillor Benga. I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Okay. So is there some kind of, uh, like, you, you, you know, you go into a Walmart or something and they do a temperature check. Is there, um, are we identifying that kind of procedure then there when somebody comes in? So my understanding is that it, each of the shelters, they are required to go through a, a screening of the individuals using the shelter, and if the screening identifies a concern from a health perspective, that they are then either um, transported to the isolation center or um, um, a hospital, depending on the situation. 
Okay, uh, my last question is uh, these vulnerable folks, uh, they're not necessarily coming in there uh, with uh, face masks or face coverings. What is the procedure for them? Like, first of all, are they allowed to come in? And then if they are, are they going to be provided with masks or some kind of face coverings? So part of the reason that we identified face coverings is to provide more um, flexibility in um, all individuals being able to uh, use the face coverings. Um, as it relates to um, how we're going to support, uh, I think it's similar to our previous discussion that we're going to we're, we're, we're going to have to work through that. And, and as Mr. Eakin, I believe, said in part of the last conversation that um, we're going to be supportive. And if there is a need for um, mask to remind people and, and, and if, they, if they've forgotten them, that, that uh, uh, we do our best to make sure that that's available. But the city isn't handing out masks. It would be more if, if uh, someone has forgotten or... Um, they're in a situation where um, it'd be difficult to uh, adhere to either the bylaw or the health orders that are in place. I know you have uh, said it before. Could you reiterate what would be the role of the city in this whole operation? As it relates to the isolation services, the city um, plays a supportive role, uh, but we're not the lead on it. And as it relates to the day programming, we're part of a, a partnership um, um, with the province, with Homeward Trust, with the agencies to try to figure out a solution for um, a, a, either a supplemental facility or a, a different method of accommodating um, d um, supplemental space for day programming. And the example uh, related to... Um, um, uh, sorry, I'm... I think it's Boyle Street. Yes, Boyle Street, where they're looking at using road right away. We would support uh, similar to the way that we supported BIAs and businesses in creating space for uh, for their needs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Um, any other questions on the first round? I'll move the second round. Uh, just before that, uh, Councillor Knack, if you could take the chair. Sure, I'll take the chair. So... Um, uh, the isolation facility, which has been at Expo and is moving to, to a different site um, yet to be announced, uh, um, that's, that's an AHS activation? That's correct. So, so very much in the provincial uh, health mandate, and so thusly they are carrying on with that, albeit at a different site. That's correct with support from... Other partners. Now we've we've offered all along the way civic facilities, starting with Expo, but also the convention center, other recreation centers that were closed should the need arise. As those start to reopen, there's fewer options. But just to be crystal clear, the city is not saying you can't uh, to the government of Alberta you can't use Expo Center anymore. Uh, the province is electing to stand down Expo Center at their discretion. That's correct. And that, that applies both to the isolation uh, activity, which is health activity or AHS activity, uh, and to the day program uh, side of things, which is community and social services ministry, uh, or has been, has been their activation in partnership with agencies and in partnership with Homeward Trust and the city. That's correct. So, so it was really a uh, two different activities in one large building and there was some sense to that because if people started to present symptoms or have any concerns on the day program side it was very easy then to um, uh, to take them over to isolation to, to have a safe place to self-isolate and and there will still be a place for people to go to who need to isolate uh, who don't have a, a private residence to do that in and that's again yet to be announced but Presumably, do we have any sense of whether that's going to be announced quickly? Because that's going to have to open in place of Expo very quickly here. Uh, well, through some of the previous answers, we've got a two-week buffer. Um, so uh, the hope is within the next couple of weeks that that will be confirmed. Oh, so the isolation activity at, at Expo will run for a little bit longer than until until that shifts over? Okay, P potentially. so the, the pending... The pending uh, close down of a uh, is a, for the other portion the day program 
that's uh, correct. Uh, at Expo. And again, that's at the discretion of the of the partners, including the province. The city would be more than happy to continue to host that activity there or in another civic venue uh, that is that is amenable to uh, Homer Trust, the agencies, and the province, and any other funders, because the federal government's provided some additional funding, I think, to to uh, Homer Trust to be able to do these kinds of activations. So maybe uh, Susan, uh, since you're on the line from your perspective, um, uh, what's 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 missing, uh, and what's uh, what's needed by way of. Uh, either nudging from the city to to other funders uh, or encouragement to the agencies and partners. How, how can we help make sure that uh, that there isn't uh, a gap here? Um, um, Mayor, and I, I apologize, but I might use a little bit different language in terms of the availability of the expo um, in that in the um, absence of the state of emergency and as with um, recreation facilities, it was, uh, was, was not just a provincial decision around funding in terms of um, needing to vacate the site. And the expectation was um, that uh, no later than the end of August uh, would we be able to be there. That was an early conversation. And honestly, everything becomes stale-dated very quickly in this environment. So that was a conversation of last month. But given the funding, and, and it's, it's in excess of $1.5 million a, a month that we've committed, in addition to direct expo costs, as well as City of Edmonton costs, which have been substantial. So um, all of those informed setting a timeline of the end of July and um, looking for alternative space that would not be as expensive, but also knowing that no matter um, kind of what timelines we were looking for, the closure of expo would be as an option or the completion of Expo as an option would be imminent because of um, the status of the facility. We, we've, we've not secured it um, even, you know, with uh, kind of from a, from a lease perspective, we're kind of occupying it at the grace of the Expo. Um, so I think that the, the site itself and the venue and the agreement to the space, I would use a little bit of different language around and the decisions to then set a timeline were based on recognizing those limited resources that uh, and, the, and the monthly costs that were incurred in supporting it in the model that it was, as well as all of the other impacts that um, you know came to bear on the site, including really significant security issues and, and needs that we would not have anticipated in another location. There is an alternate proposal or a successor proposal. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, we've been looking for space, and, and David's team has been uh, going through a lot of different scenarios in terms of space. Just to give you an idea, when it comes to day services, we are looking for approximately 150 to 200 square feet per person served, and with the gap in terms of um, available capacity going down to um, approximately 150 compared to 650 pre-pandemic, that's, you know, anything short of uh, 10,000, 20,000 square feet doesn't contribute a lot. Um, so we're looking at some pretty substantial square footage in order to meet the, the gap. Um, quite frankly, um, you know, while we've, we've, we've looked at something today, um, I'm very interested in kind of what the outcome of that is. We've been looking at stuff regularly. In the absence of that, we may have to look at other, other more temporary um, stand-up options in terms of structure. Um, but at this point in time, um, that kind of square footage in an area for day services where things are also accessible either by foot or obvious transit, um, I, I think it's fair to say, David, our options have been pretty limited. Well, I'm out of time, but I'll move a second round of questions. Thank you. Can I get a seconder? I'll, I'll second it. Uh, I'll, and we'll just take unanimous consent of council uh, for a second round. Are, is there any objections to that? Hearing none, I'll return the chair back to you, Mr. Or Mayor, Mayor Avison. Okay, thank you very much. So on the second round, Councillor McKean. Thank you very much. So I am quite concerned that we have problems ahead because um, we have lost sleeping shelter spaces as well, have we not? Kinsman closed uh, Central Lions. I don't actually know the status of that. But we have lost shelter space as well, right? We have. I'm, I'm sorry if uh, you don't mind, I'll answer that. We have, um, with the mustard seed leaving the Kinsmen, it was 108, had a capacity of 180. They are now in their 
previous location with a capacity of approximately 42, and they've looked at a couple of other um, small expansion overflow locations. We post the capacity, though, we're at about 750 cots today, and we've been well under that, so we haven't been over capacity. The greatest risk is that in the event of a outbreak in any one facility, we would um, immediately have uh, a loss of that facility and also going to greater separation in that facility. So we've We've modeled all of that, and our biggest um, uh, concern at the moment would be certainly an outbreak of any kind. Well, and I wonder with uh, if we disperse the community into uh, camps around the urban realm, and we've seen them in every ward, I think, um, how do we know when somebody becomes symptom symptomatic? And how do we pull them out of that situation and get them to the isolation center when we don't have that sort of controlled, more controlled environment where people were being watched? Um, are you concerned about that, Ms. McGee, or have I got that wrong? No, I'm, I'm extremely concerned. And our, our planning and our modeling early on anticipated also the growth of encampments, not just because of a shelter capacity question, but we do know that people have historically pre-pandemic avoided shelters because of their concerns for their own health. And in the environment of pandemic, that's even compounded. So um, we've been very concerned. Our um, response needs to be certainly the, the day space that we've been discussing and also outreach. Now, you mentioned the geographic spread of um, encampments, just from a basic FTE, um, how many hours in a day and to connect with people, we need considerably more staff. And we budgeted two additional teams, but again, that's pending federal approval of funding. Um, I guess last question here, or uh, last theme, Mr. Lachlan, that camp, volunteer supported camp down in Rossdale, who owns those lands? They're currently on city of Edmonton land. So that the province did not purchase those lands from us? Nope. Okay, fair enough. And, and if, if I'm gonna repeat back what I heard from you, Mr. Jeveny has been down there. We're looking at ways that we might be able to support that volunteer run camp. I, I think uh, it would be good for Mr. Jeveny to uh, just provide uh, um, an update on where things are at with that. Sure, Roger here. We've, we've had some preliminary conversations. Uh, we have a meeting down there later this afternoon to continue to talk about uh, some of the needs of the camp, what some of the other agencies are doing to support them and sort of what our role will be going forward, uh, working with them, trying to find some some resolution to a number of these issues. So, Mr. Lachlan, last question. I'm going to get a lot of response from all sides on this issue, including people down in the camp because we made contact with them. Who is my first contact? Is it you? Is it Ms. McGee? Is it Mr. Jebney? As it relates to the Rossdale encampment, it's Mr. Jevney. Okay. Um, all others, um, I think we've been using David as sort of the conduit for um, those sorts of um, types of inquiries. So while, although he's here today, David is getting some much deserved, <laughs> deserved time off. I think it's a combination of David or Ms. Nicole Poirier, who is covering for David right now. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, question for you. This uh, seems like a developing situation which could develop quickly. Uh, would it be appropriate to ask for updates every two weeks on this matter? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, we'll have an EAC in about two weeks, um, two weeks in a day. So we'll be able to get another uh, update at about that time. Um, and I, I imagine where, where this is at would be part of that. I'm making an assumption here that where this is at would be part of that re verbal report at that time. So um, that would be the forum to deal with it in, I, yeah. And yeah. the weekly uh, updates from um, uh, Mr. Aiken um, can also provide an update, Councillor McKean. Yeah, I just think we, as a group, need to hear about what's going on, especially if things start to um, tip more into crisis. So um, I'm not going to make a motion. I think as long as we could deal with that at EAC meetings, I think that would be 
an appropriate place. So we will, as we have, ensure that you're updated to, to the best of our ability. And um, uh, as this evolves, we'll continue to provide updates. Thank you, Mr. Lachlan. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, maybe a couple more questions. So uh, let's take the chair. It, uh, it is now a, uh, a period of um, summer is finally here, it seems, at least with the weather. Uh, and uh, that, that creates challenges uh, for folks who not only lack a place to, to isolate, potentially, if they're experiencing symptoms, but a place to take shelter from the heat. Um, so I, I appreciate the creativity of outdoor space for, um, uh, for the provision of services at a, at a physical distance, and there's sort of a temperature at which that works and a temperature at which on, on hot pavement that becomes less feasible at precisely when it's maybe needed the most. So, um, and then it, 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 before you know it, we'll have the opposite problem with cold again. So um, there was great urgency uh, around this and, and we called forth commitments from the government of Alberta at the time uh, and the federal government added additional resources uh, to be able to, to fund uh, emergency shelter space, emergency day program space and, 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 and isolation space. Um, now, strictly speaking, the aid we, we received from the federal government a couple weeks ago and was confirmed to the provincial match yesterday, uh, those funds are not necessarily for uh, this envelope of work, they're for core municipal business. Um, uh, but, and, and it really shouldn't fall to us, consistent theme building here. Um, but uh, at, at the very least, we will continue to offer civic facilities on a cost recovery basis for, for this kind of activity and, and continue to cooperate with Ms. McGee and the agencies to try to find the right size of facility. Perhaps Expo is too big, perhaps it, it, it conflicts with other activity, but um, at minimum on a again, on a cost recovery basis to start with, recognizing that there are resources in play and they may or may not be sufficient. And if they aren't, we may have to, may have to take up that cause again, as we did back in April. But um, the premise back then was we have inventory and we want to help. And I assume that nothing has changed about our position. Um, I, I would say, um First step is finding the right solution, which has been challenging for the team, reviewing a number of different locations and sites. Um, and then second step is the, the funding and, and getting that resolved. Uh, team is working really hard to, to get through the first step uh, to then inform what that second step would be. So then, but a, a site, whether it's civic or whether it's other public sector or whether it's private sector, wh whatever the site is uh, that's deemed to be suitable forms the basis of a proposal back to the funders, which may or may not include us, but, but certainly also include provincial and federal supporters. That's correct. Uh, yes. Within their mandates around this. That's correct. Um, and we might choose to take a role in that, but, but we would not all on ourselves necessarily take that on, nor were we asked to back in April when, when the facility was stood up in the first place. That's correct. Um, I, I would say that uh, along the lines of compassion, uh, we should really make sure that we get to a solution and if funding is what's getting in the way, we will figure that out as quickly as possible. But the challenge we're having right now is finding the right solution. And it does mean, and Councillor McKean raised this, the potential that we could be looking at outdoor as well. Suitable outdoor. Well, and I and, uh, heard Ms. McGee mention, you know, temporary structure. There are, uh, you know, tents and other things that can provide shade. And as a matter of fact, there's an awful lot of that infrastructure not being deployed this summer that would otherwise be up for festivals. So, um, I mean, it, it's 
heartbreaking to even have to consider that. Uh, but we, we do have options and I, I trust in the creativity of the of the team here at the city and certainly Susan and the very creative folks at the agencies to to work to find this. Uh, I have to confess that the public is asking us and, and, it, and it continues to feel like things are rolling downhill at City Hall. Um, that that a whole a whole of government um, provincial, federal, municipal, and agency coordination would would be better suited to uh, to respond to. So, um, but I appreciate that we're at the table and we're doing our best to facilitate a good outcome there and a transition from Expo uh, to something appropriate and right size. So, um, I'll return the chair. Thank you. Uh, I need uh, a motion to receive for information. So moved. Thank you, Councilor Second. McKean. Seconded by Councilor Knack. Uh, anything further on this? Anyone wishing to speak? Not seeing any. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I would just. <coughs> I would speak well, briefly. Let, let me just, and, let me um, just double check because I think oh, that yeah. would be. I think that would be to close. So bef just before then, I give Councillor McKean the opportunity to close. Anybody else? Hearing none, Councillor McKean to close on receipt of information. Go ahead. Thank you, and I will try not to go on and on. It's been a long day um, during recess, uh, and I appreciate everybody's contributions um, to the effort to deal with our vulnerable populations in Edmonton. Certainly, Mr. Lachlan, all the city staff, but Ms. McGee, your staff as well, um, and the people from AHS and certainly from the nonprofit social service agencies, some of whom, those folks, are down helping to volunteer at the camp down in Rossdale, as I discovered last night. And I, I remain um, quite worried uh, about what it's going to look like in the, ne in the coming weeks um, with the expo closed. And I just think there'll be a dispersal of people. And I don't think we have the, sh and never did have the right shelter um, capacity um, <clears throat> or philosophy to deal with our homeless population. And, um, I, I do worry about an, uh, an outbreak in that community, though we've been, through the good work of all the people I just mentioned, we haven't had that happen. And I'm worried about conflicts in the community. And we just had a public hearing, <clears throat> went on several days, uh, that talked a lot about conflict between police and bylaw peace officers with vulnerable communities. So by, by not coordinating this, we will end up with conflict. But... I, I, I will take comfort today hearing from Ms. McGee and you, Mr. Lachlan, and you, Mr. Aitken, and you, Mr. Jebney, that we're on top of this. And I'll wish you Godspeed on it and creativity because uh, we have to look after this uh, community well or we will end up with much higher costs uh, and much bigger problems than we're having today. So um, I'll stop there. but. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote on receipt of information. Yes. I've got 13 votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you and display the vote and that's carried unanimously. Okay, that concludes um, the business for today's special council meeting. Um, here's hoping we don't need to see you again until EAC uh, two Thursdays hence. So uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your break and thank you for making time to be part of today's meeting. We're adjourned.